All right, and we are right on time. That's to you, Mr. Robert Green Fingers Thomas. <laughs> We're right on time. So take it away, Brian. Yeah, good morning, Living Soil Nerds. Happy Thursday to you. Uh, again, we're just kind of going out of our way to bring you the best and brightest, and we have another real uh, treat for you. Um, this is a special day for me, just some quick uh, upfront stuff. I asked my wife uh, to to marry me a year ago uh, today on this very day, uh, so that's something that's uh, really important for us. So we're uh, just excited to uh, move into this new chapter in our life, so just want to put it out there. I appreciate uh, everything you do for me, Natasha. She's a big reason why we're able to do this show every Thursday. So just wanted to uh, start off with that. Uh, also, Brian, uh, Brian, I can match you on that front. Today's my anniversary. Fantastic. See, <laughs> Congratulations. And I guarantee you without these ladies in our life, there's no way we'd be able to uh, to do this for you guys. So just wanted to, to give a shout out. Uh, Leighton as well. I know his lady is always uh, sometimes you can hear her doing the dishes in the background, you know, life's going on by, you know, behind the scenes. Uh, so we just appreciate uh, our ladies in our lives. And I know uh, Joey uh, definitely appreciates you as well. Uh, for you guys that don't know, uh, we also have interviewed Joey Berger. Uh, in my opinion, I think Leighton would co-sign this. That gentleman is a living legend with with a lot of the stuff that you guys are, are finding out about. Uh, so go check his uh, video out on um what was that like two, three weeks ago? I think we interviewed Joey. Uh, can, so we're can excited. We, can to we talk get to a you. can we get a shirtless Joey uh, camera Rob. bomb photo bomb? <laughs> ah, there he is. <laughs> He's not shirtless, but uh, boo. <laughs> he was shirtless up, two bro? minutes ago. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And I, I feel like, all right, so, you know, there's just a lot that you guys bring to the uh, to the industry and just bring to the community as a whole. And I, I just wanted to also say that we are very grateful for that. Um, a lot of the things that we have learned or we've been learning from you guys, uh, especially, you know, Joey, and uh, you know, over the last few years, I feel like just pumping out a lot of education on YouTube and Instagram and all those different things. So I'm excited to now uh, give the platform to you and, and talk to you because I understand that you are an OG in your own right. Uh, you've been an herbologist or herbalist. Uh, I never know uh, which way to say that for uh, 20 plus years. So I kind of wanted to start there and let people understand kind of more of your background, the reason why I would definitely consider that an OG as well. Uh, and, and the way that you cultivate and that kind of stuff, it's very... Um, uh, matter of fact, almost blueprint, you know, when I was doing research on you for our interview this week, I feel like you just really understand these concepts. So I'm excited for our viewers to be able to understand this. And it seems like you're very articulate and able to put it in um, like layman's terms. So it's very basic stuff. So uh, I would imagine if you're newer to a lot of these techniques, uh, get your pen and paper because this is going to be one hell of a show. Uh, mm -hmm. Leighton also, uh, I'm sure you know, she's a Dem Pure certified farmer. So uh, I feel like for a lot of the, the old heads and that kind of stuff, that's really all you got to say to a lot of uh, people anymore. So shout out to them as well. Yeah, big shout out to them and the work that they've been doing over the years and getting people to come together as a family uh, and not charging any money to be certified and having you know the olders help the youngers as they transition through the process of becoming them. So big shout out to Dragonfly Earth Medicine and Josh Kelly and their whole crew. So yeah, dive right in tomorrow. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. We'd love to learn more about the, the herbalist side of you, the, the 20 plus years of what you've learned, because I feel like at, at that level, you just really understand um, plants. You know, just I feel like a lot of us understand cannabis or building soil for cannabis. Uh, but if you took me and started to ask me, you know, a lot of things I want to learn today, even about like stinging nettles and the benefit of all that kind of stuff, I would have to go back and research a lot of that stuff to be able to give the, the right answers on a bunch of different questions. So uh, I'm excited to just kind of pick your brain and, and see where this goes. Awesome. OK, um, my path kind of started out very, very unusual, honestly. Um, I knew I was going to work like an environmental science. That was like my whole growing up. I was like, I'm going to be an environmental scientist. And I would like learn plants when I was younger. I studied a lot of the rainforest plants because I was determined I was going to work in Brazil. And um, I was even trying to learn like Portuguese at a young age because that's where I was going. But um, life has so many twists and turns. And um, I ended up like in college studying theater and environmental science at the same time and just really went full on with theater for a long time. 
And so that was just part of my path and I got into acting and everything. Um, but through that, I, um, I was out in LA for like in Hollywood for a while and that path led me down to like an addiction and um, I had to like pull myself out of like this drug addiction and this fake world and like how I did that was like natural health and like I really dived deep into my own health and trying to understand myself and who I was. It was really just an evolution of figuring out who I am and that's really what led me to um, start working with medicinal plants and understanding diet and how diet was everything you know if you really want to have health then you need to have a clean diet and that really led me down a really um obsessed passionate path for a really long time and from that i started studying um massage therapy which led me to reiki which led me to body talk and yoga and I studied a lot of different um, healing modalities for years. And I always knew I was going to end up studying like full on into herbs. Um, and I did. I ended up taking off for a little bit. I was in Babylon, was what I call it, for a while. And I had like a really great massage practice. And I was starting to incorporate a bunch of different herbs. And I had already become an, um, an aromatherapist, which is like the study of essential oils. And so that was already part of my path. Um, but I was in Babylon and I just realized like this wasn't my thing. And um, I uh, remember seeing a RV along the side of the road and was like, what if? And one day I did it. I like bought a bus and I traveled around with my two year old son and we, I did wolfing. That's really where my farming journey began. And um, was through the world, you know, what is it, the World Organization of Organic Farmers. And you're able to do work trade. And so I worked on a lot of different farms and many different climates, like desert climate to like really wet and kind of rainy and Midwest and even up to California. So I got to see a lot of different environments. And but on my journey of traveling, I, I got a lot of different skills. And one of that is that I end up apprenticing with an herbalist. And I, like, stayed at her place for a really long time. I can't even remember how long. Definitely a couple months. And she, like, just took me under her wing. I had my little boy, and she showed me so many different things about making medicines. And um, But to back up a little bit, even when I was in theater and I was in my whole acting thing in LA, I was completely obsessed with making my own products. Like I would spend days in the bathroom making products of shampoo and like facial clays and foot baths and like you name it. I've still got recipe cards to this day of that time I spent just really obsessed with self care. And um, I think that's kind of like been my journey is been self care and learning how to take care of myself through diet and this exploration. And that's really my path towards herbalism is just exploration. And so this woman really like shifted my world. Like at this point, I started realizing that I could feel like what the plants were were about. And I had studied also with. Um, with a coven for a little while and so my one of my first introductions into herbs was magical purposes of them and so I realized during this time when I was studying herbs with the coven and then I started traveling and with the herbs with this woman and learning their medicinal properties and knowing both these sides of them that I felt like I wasn't learning like but I was remembering and I think that it's for a lot of us, you know, there's a lot of like witchy herbalists and women and men coming around right now. And you're realizing that it's, you can understand what the plants are about. Like you just get a sensation. And I started realizing that there was a really strong connection between the plants and myself. And I would just get impressions from them and just kind of know what I felt like they needed and then I would research it later and I'd be like, oh, right on. I was kind of on point with what that said. So that just really led me down um, starting to study herbs. And uh, but then I, I, I mean, my, my path is, is, is interesting. 
And so during the time after being with the herbalist, I was in rainbow gatherings for a while. Like I'd follow, you know, the rainbow trail. And in that, I ended up being part of Calm, which was the um, healers at Rainbow Gathering because everyone ended up getting injured or something would happen, especially with the kids. And so I just would always take that role. It just seemed like the role that I would, it would just fit me really easily that I would always tend to be in. And um, so the Rainbow Gatherings then led me um, to a horse caravan down in Mexico and um, we were, that was a really huge part of my transition into like really natural farming and really learning about how to um, do these really awesome, just, I don't know, let's see, that, that time period, let me just kind of go back a little bit. I decided to sell my bus and I was going to have the least amount of footprint on this earth as possible. So even with my two-year-old son, I think it was three at that point, I got rid of all vehicles. I didn't want a phone. The only way you could get a hold of me is through email. I just wanted to disappear and have, like, the littlest footprint as possible. So on that, I ended up hooking up with the horse caravan in Mexico called Nomads United. And their whole objective was to have no footprint, you know, is to go by horse and – um so we went down there and you had to have like skills to join. And so my skills that I came with is I end up becoming a raw chef during some of my travels as well. Um, I know how to cook for like a lot of people. Um, I'm a fire dancer. I also do acrobalance. And then I also had the skill I came with knowing some herbs and being able to do some healing. And so um, we got down there, and our whole point in that caravan was to teach environmental education and do circus. And so it was really fun because my two favorite things of environmental science and then um, acting like theater came together in this, like, beautiful um, – collection of, of events and um, so we we're riding horses we would go in to these places and like villages and people would ride ahead and, and kind of scout out where we could go and there was like 32 of us in this international horse caravan from all over the world me and my son were the only ones from the states so you can see the collection I mean as, everywhere it was so fun and um so we'd come in and we would teach, we'd go into schools and like set up recycling stations. And then we would do skits with the kids about, you know, if you put trash in the water, if you put bleach in the water, it goes on down and it kills the animals. So we would do these little skits like that. And um, at the end of our time there, we would do this uh, big circus event with, you know, we had great musicians, great entertainers with us. And then we would do the magic hat. And so that's how we made our money and to the next place we went. And um, I got to be part of making a biodigester where it's like, you know, where you're collecting the poop and you're creating this like it, what we had was these big plastic things at the end. The poop would go in, the methane would raise and then it would get pumped down into a stove. And people were able to use that. And especially communities were able to set that up so there could be cooking availability, you know, at the time of the year. And um, that was really fun to be part of. And um, then we also set up washing stations outside of the rivers because especially in some of those smaller villages uh, where even cars couldn't get through, that you had um, people just washing directly into <laughs> the rivers, like bleach, everything. And so we would set washing stations up a little outside the rivers where people were still going down to the rivers. It's a community thing, but they would be washing their stuff and it would at least go into the ground before it got to, yeah, before it got to the river. And so that was like a big part of my experience down there was really learning like this, just environment, like again, about being this um, nature warrior. That's what we were about. And um, during that time, I mean, it was full on. It sounds cool and fun, but it wasn't. It was intense. There was, like, I watched a horse fall off a cliff. There was a, I mean, there was another time we had to, like, open up a huge tumor on the side, and that was another thing I was a part of. And then, like, people fell off. Like, the horses would raise up. Our horses were not that tame, not at all. And one of the girls, like, slid, and from her shoulder to her back, it was completely opened up. 
And um, we were in the woods. We literally camped in Petreros, like fields. And so we, I, I, there was a time I hadn't even gone inside for like three months. And so I had to, that was like a huge part of my own, like learning my intuition. Like I didn't speak the language well, so I couldn't ask other healers there. I had to intuitive what plants were around me that I could use and then just keep it clean as I could. And um, that was a really big part into like, just really trusting and learning um, herbs and then being part of nature. Like we would have to find when we camp, like listen for creeks, you know, to listen for the where the water came from because we couldn't camp anywhere there wasn't water. So I learned to like really become aware of my surroundings like so much. And it was, it was just a big part of my journey. And it was that caravan and um, just really walking in tune with nature. And um, it changed everything. And, like we rewired my brain. So like when I, when I decided to come back to the States, I was thinking of living in Mexico. Yep. <laughs> and um, I had this really deep calling that I decided it was time to get land. And it wasn't supposed to be in Mexico. Like I knew I was supposed to come back to the States and do what I was supposed to do here. And I'm still figuring all that out. But it was like, it was so strong that I came back me and my son and um we uh we end up living at a, a community in texas and that was really my really big first dive into gardening like i had gardened doing the work trade and that was all fun and all but my friends decided to leave for the summer and they left me with a half an acre garden like a full-on food producing garden where they had a restaurant on the weekends and um they, uh, I was, they trusted me enough to like do this. And I had no clue what I was doing. I, the, my friends, like, uh, he was a good friend of mine who had started this, this, um, community. And I asked him, he's like, you need to put this irrigation in. I'm like, oh, I don't know how to put irrigation in. And he's like, download it from the universe. You, you know how. And I was just like, okay, Google, right? All right, Google, we got this. And so I literally Googled how to put this fucking drip irrigation in, and I fucked up so many times. But that whole garden was, I got no, I got no guidance. So I just did it. And um, that was really an experience. And I realized that that was my first time realizing that peppers take like sometimes two to three weeks to sprout. And I kept replanting the fucking peppers, thinking like, what is wrong with these peppers? And um, there was just so many experiments that went wrong. That was like so many beautiful lessons, you know? And I loved it though. I loved it there because he also did what was called industrial harvesting. So we would scan like Craigslist at the time to see any of the free stuff that maybe we could get for the community and go pick up. We would also go around with trailers at night and pick up in the neighborhoods, all the bags of leaves and take the leaves back for mulch. And um, we also had like the power company come in and dump all their wood chips. And so we were, it was really fun because I learned how to do a lot of this like harvesting from the surround, what was, you know, just using what we can. And, um, but when I was at that community, I also realized I'm like, okay, that was fun. I'm ready to move on from Texas. And, uh, I had a friend that was like really, really adamant about me coming out to California and I had felt the call for a while and I knew I was going to end up out here. Um, I just, I just felt it feel really at home out here. And he's like, you're going to come trim. Now this is going to be great. You're going to make money and you know, you can do all your other little, I always traveled with different things I made and um, products and stuff. And he's like, there'll be money here. And he's just really convinced me to come out. So I made my way out to California. I baked a bunch of chocolate chip cookies and I made some like goo ball edibles and I made our gas out to California to trim. And, but on my way out there, I was like, I had one of those aha moments. I was like, oh, I'm going to start growing cannabis. It just makes sense. I'm, I'm a healer. I've been studying this I'm studying herbs. Like cannabis has been such a huge part of my journey. Like I could tear up thinking about it. Like she's helped me, she saved my life. And, um, you know, and so I was like, this is it. I know exactly what I'm doing. So I came out to California and each place I trimmed at, they kept putting me separate. So I had a kid with me, like my, he was 
four or five at the time, maybe. Yeah, six. I don't even remember. Um, yeah, probably about six at that point. And so I had him with me. So I would have the grower just sitting there talking to me and they would answer all my questions because I got lots of questions when I was running to learn something. And um, I just kept doing that from place to place. And uh, I ended up in Lake County. I was at, I remember I was in Grass Valley and we got poison oak like really bad, like so bad. And um, my friend I was with was like, okay, we're going to go to Lake County. I got a brother there. We're going to heal. And I'm like, where the fuck's Lake County? All right. And so I ended up in Lake County for like two weeks naked with clay on my body. And, um, and then afterwards, I fell in love with this place because we got hot springs. It's close to like, it's not too far from Shasta. It's close to the city if I want to do the city cultural thing. And it, it's just beautiful. We have so many like just beautiful little hidden gems out in Lake County. And um, luckily I had someone there that took me serious. I have one of my best friends, give a shout out to Dream Creek Farm, Chris. And he really showed me, he took me under his wing and knew I was serious about growing cannabis. And um, that same year, that was like 11 years ago, that I took my first permaculture class. And so then I started bringing in compost teas into our little grower circle. And, um, and then from there, I've just, it's just really progressed because then I realized, well, I'm going to do the permaculture way. Whereas all the others were like, they didn't want to grow plants inside their pots. They're like, Oh, it takes away nutrients from the cannabis. I'm like, no, 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 we need more. Let's, let's grow like the forest does. You see how nature does it. Like she's, there's no spot that's like free of like plants usually if she does it right. And so I started bringing in a lot of different plants and then also just knowing like which ones I wanted to work with and really experimenting with um, ones that I would be like, I think this would be pest resistant because it's like, you know, it's really strong with essential oils. And then really diving deep, I, I met um, this woman, Dia, Dia Damon from Lo Nomad's Landing and Spencer, her partner. And uh, they really clued me in into natural farming, into what, um, I mean, natural farming could be a big range of things, but more of like some of the Jadam techniques of making your own teas and nu um, nutrients, because I was spending like thousands on nutrients, um, or organic, you know, all organic, all perfect, but thousands. And so they really clued me in on how to make my own um like calcium teas, my own microbial solutions that I was like spending $800 a bucket on from some place that they probably weren't even alive when they got to my soil after I started understanding it a lot. And that was like a really big path of me diving like full on into this microbial world. And, um, but through it all, yeah. And that's even when I had the beds up and but through it all, I've still been working with different plants. Like I was still obsessed at the end of the year. I would get so excited. But most of all, my shake, shake went into like making solves. And I really had no idea how to do it. I was just like doing it. And um, I'm really big into like learning hands on kind of jumping feet first. And so I ended up finally taking a master herbalist class <laughs> like online and kind of getting lots of different books about that. And that um, it's really kind of interesting because my natural farming like evolution and my herbalist evolution have really gone hand in hand because as I learn more about the herbs, the more I'm learning all their different like purposes. Like I love putting lemon balm in my garden because lemon balm is so good for us to help relax our nervous system. It's um, really good for to given to children. But, and it's also, it uplifts you too when you smell it. You kind of get this like uplifting, but like calming feeling. And so then it brings that energy into your garden. But then at the same point, it's that's one of those smelly herbs. So it's pest resistant and there's not many pests around it. You're looking at it. So I love to grow those close to my cannabis and like, and like line my rose with it. And um, so those just started really absurd understanding. And because I had started understanding so much about nutrition and my own health, I realized what I was doing with the plants, you know, and I'm giving them teas. I'm giving them nettle teas and I'm giving myself nettle teas. I'm giving nettle horsetail. Anything I'm thinking about for making for myself, I'm thinking about making for the plants as well. And so for me, it's just this beautiful, like, you know, symbiology of like of this evolution of natural farming and herbalism.
And hey, um, tomorrow, real quick, uh, is there a difference between nettles and stinging nettles, or the, is that the same thing? They're the same thing. Mm -hmm. okay. There's a there, there is one called dead nettle, and that's the little purple tops, but it doesn't really have the same makeup as the as the stinging nettles. And no. the stinging nettles are really cool because it's like you can eat. I mean, there's so many ways to be able to process them. But even when you're collecting them, the stinging nettle part is really good for circulation. Like it's good when you're harvesting those if you're barehanded with it. Um, they even have this technique uh, we were reading out in the book, and I've seen. <laughs> I've not tried this yet, but where you take the nettles and you whip your back with it because it's supposed to like create that circulation, especially up and down your spine. Like they're really amazing herbs. They're one of my favorite allies. <laughs> Yeah, that's something that I feel like you kind of coined the phrase of. And then something I wanted to get into, hopefully deeper with these uh, stinging nettles, is you were saying that uh, the cannabis plant kind of maybe sees it as some kind of attack so that you can improve your trichome production. That's something, a little gold nugget that I learned from you. Do you mind going deeper in that with our audience? Yeah, definitely. That's one of my favorite things to, to tell people about. Um, and Dia actually told me this. This was a secret she told me, and I tried it. And it was like you're, you grow your stingy nettles right beside your cannabis. And I found that it works best. Like I plant it right underneath. And I've planted on the outside before, but I've seen it plant. It works really well when you plant it more underneath where it's like the roots are combining together. And it's like there's a defense system, like a defense. The cannabis puts its defense system up against the nettles. And what is cannabis defense system? trichomes it produces more trichomes you know it's those crystals and that's its defense system and so i did these study like side by side same strain of um of the cannabis with the nettles and without the nettles and it was so significantly different it was like the other was beautiful but this was like you know that just that power it was like all the way to the end of the leaf trying to trichomes and i was like wow that's beautiful but let me show some people too. And, and like, I wrote that down, but I tried it again the next year. And I was like, okay, let me just see if this is really working. And I did another study and it was, it was right on. And then now I've practiced, then I started practicing with, you know, where I could actually put it. And then I found, even if it was out here to the side, it worked okay, but not as much as when I did it right, like really underneath the cannabis and really mix those roots. And I did, I found a significant difference in the trichome production. And you're simply chop and dropping that when it, if it gets out of control? Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I do chop and drop it because it's really good for the soil, but I use it all. Like nettle root is one of the only plants that really helps with um, testosterone. And it's one of, there's only like two herbs that help with like the male prostrate and it's nettle root and sal palmetto. And so for me, if the, the nettle gets out of hand, I am just ripping up the roots and I'm making tinctures. Um, but the nettle there's so many uses for it. It's like if it gets out of hand, yes, because you could bring, you could fill up a 50 gallon barrel with that and feed that to your plants. That is so much nitrogen. That's so many minerals and vitamins. That's what I feel like my plants just like absolutely love. They get super green when I'm feeding them that. And then for ourselves, like we can put that in soup. We can put make a teas out of it. You know, like I every day I have nettles. I powder my nettles and make a smoothie mix out of that with a bunch of other herbs. And then throughout the day, I'm drinking nettle and horsetail. Those two are like two of my main favorites. And those are two great ones for the plants as well. So because you're adding silica with your um, horsetail. And so for me, if it, get, get, it getting out of hand is like a bonus and it doesn't happen because I feel like that's one of the things I really try to cultivate. Leighton, have you heard of that little gold nugget there? Or is that a new one? Uh, uh, that is a new one, uh, growing the nettles to create the defenses. And Brian, have you ever harvested nettle yourself? No, I haven't. Um, oh, I used to use stinging it. nettle um, for – it was supposed to help me with allergies. Um, but it, to be honest with you, it didn't really work. But I don't know if my, my source was exactly where it should have been. I got it from a, like a farmer's market, flea market kind of thing. Yeah, you gotta you gotta get out in the field and actually harvest it. What she says is so true. I mean, you get zinged all over your hands, and you're kind of like it hurts, but it doesn't really hurt. But it definitely stimulates your 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 circulation. Mm -hmm. I love to put it in compost for the for the same reason she's talking about. There's just so many good properties with nettle. It's it's just an amazing plant. But that was a really great gold bar <clears throat> as far as polyculture is concerned. And there are probably other plants that'll do the same thing. 
that just maybe haven't been discovered mm-hmm. yet. Um, well, and she's a big proponent of like trap plants, right? And and that kind of thing, and just kind of building up your entire garden with Mother Nature. Um, I know you're really getting in, or you know, you have been into Hugel culture. Um, I, I would love to kind of kind of go down that road and. Um, Leighton, if there's other stuff that you can add into this, uh, I hope that we can really dive deep in this for the audience today. Um, Pauline was just talking to me. She wants to add something about nettles. So I missed what you said. Can you repeat that, Brian? Uh, that's all right. Go ahead and say with that. And um, no, she's just gonna she's going to go freshen up a little bit. But yes, <laughs> trap plants and banker plants are critical. Um, you know, I'm using them at the ranch and I'm using them on other projects because they bring in the indigenous, you know, uh, predators, which are so important. And if there's no space for them on your farm, your ranch, whatever, then they're not going to come and support your, your, your monoculture or your polyculture. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, you know, I, I can't stress enough having those companion plants, trap plants, banker plants. And for the audience, a banker plant is something that attracts and kind of think of it like a bank and stores these insects, these predators, a trap plant is a great plant to have an indicator of potential pressure. So as the aphids move in and out, that's the first thing they're going to do is land on that trap plant. So as long as you're keeping an eye on that trap plant, you know what's going on around you. But they can also be very dangerous because if you don't keep an eye on that trap plant, the insects are going to get out of control on that and then spread to your cash crop. So it's one of those things that it's a double-edged sword if you're not careful. Um, so yeah, definitely... Big, big proponent of polyculture, you know, adding different plants, you know, you could, like the old, put a pepper plant next to your tomato plant. You'll get a wonderful tomato. It'll have a little spice, a little heat to it. You know, those are just one of a billion tricks of getting plants to work in harmony with each other. So I'm going to spin this around so Pauline can be seen. All right. There you go. Looking good, babe. Bye. Hi, good morning. Sorry, I'm just starting to move. Uh, so um, I'm a stage four uh, ovarian cancer survivor, and I'm in a metastasis right now, and I'm going through some new treatment. And uh, I work very, very closely with a natural path. And one of the things that mitigates the side effects of uh, treatment is nettle. And um, mm. so, you know, taking... Um, I take uh, seven, 21, 21 nettle uh, pills a day. Um, and it's uh, between nettle and um, <clears throat> uh, uh, frankincense. There's another question. Um, but, but, uh, uh, is, is that, uh, um, <clears throat> and um, which you'll have to look up. I'm not, I'm not sure the Latin name for that. But all of these plants that you're talking about um, can be grown along with plants. And these are plants that we- Hey, hey Pauline, just just quickly, Leighton, I think the microphone's on you and we can hear you clanking away. All right, I'll scoot, scoot in, honey. Well, uh, get, get a little bit closer to the, to the computer, because this is- the- no, no. Leighton, do, do you do you have like you sound crystal clear? So you have the microphone. So you need to stand next to Pauline. I don't. It's it's the computer. So I just oh, really? don't have her close enough to the computer. Oh, OK. All right. Cool. Carrie, take, take it away, Pauline. Can you, like, did you hear anything? I said? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we, we, we heard it. We just heard a lot of I think Leighton was just stacking boxes or something while we were talking. <laughs> yeah, he, he does that here. I was trying to move the... We forgot we were live on YouTube. Anyway, so, you know, all of these, these plants... I'm so happy you. I heard the end of this conversation as I was getting up because these plants, you know, that you're talking about that can be grown along all of the, everything you're doing in the cannabis industry and the organic regenerative um, properties of these, you know, these are desperately needed, you know, for, for people. Like right now, genistein. There is, genistein is probably the number one thing we need uh, for cancer survival, you know, to mitigate side effects. And I can't get any, um, you know, because I buy it wholesale and uh, in powder form. 
and it's it's back ordered till November, which is really wigging me out. So, you know, these are the things that, you know, I mean, if we could get the cannabis industry wrapped around, you know, planting all of these plants around their cannabis plants, not only will it give the cannabis plant their properties of everything they have to heal, which is healing me. I mean, look at my hair, you know, it's not falling out, right? You know, and I'm having some pretty serious treatment. You know, it's not yet, and I'm hoping it won't, and it doesn't matter. It's, it's just hair, but, you know, these are things that we think about, you know, that we have to go through, uh, you know, as, as, as people surviving. And I think you make a really, really incredibly valuable point. As cannabis industry, the regenerative farmers are getting killed by the price of pounds of weed because of the fucking middlemen. Here's a great way to subsidize there their income mm -hmm. by growing these critical plants and then getting a collective together to sell it to people who need it. And then maybe starting a collective where you sell it to, you know, to, to industries, you know, that are buying it and natural selling pass. a natural cast and that. But then you have another industry for people like me who are completely broke because I'm spending $2,000 a month on herbs. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, that's more than most people spend on their mortgage. So, you know, I'm just, this, this is just, a, this is so dear to my heart. And, and, you know, this is my, my goal when I get out of this, when I'm, when I'm rocking and rolling again, man, this, this is where I'm going. You know, let's, let's do all this together, right? It's not just about a cannabis plant because I use cannabis and I advocate for it and really, really heavily, but I have a real low tolerance for THC. So I can't do, you know, you know, I did suppositories, high suppositories for two and a half years. And that really helped the first round. But now because of the buildup in my system, if I do any more than a 0.35 of a gram suppository, I will convulse on the floor of THC. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll be on the floor and I'm like this. I can't, I'm uh, talk about your girlfriend. Yeah. And yeah. And so, you know, I, I just set up another GoFundMe because, you know, this everything goes out the window so so quickly. Layton's been just my love, you know, supporting me in the last couple of years with this. So, you know, every little bit helps. Every little bit helps. So we'll, we'll, we'll get the information. We'll, we'll get the information to you. But really what will help in the long run for everyone, you know, when I'm long gone, is is planting natural herbs, and I've I've already given a list out once. I will send mm -hmm. it out again, and if you know, if all of you, all of you cannabis farmers who I know and love, would just plant just a couple of these, you know, in your acreage, it will make a huge difference, and it will help you supplement. What are the main plants they should be planting? These are these are what I was trying to Genestine. Uh, Genestine. Here, let me just get a list. <laughs> yeah, because I've to be honest, I've never heard of Genestine. I'm you sure. You go get our list, and uh, mm -hmm. and then she could put it out there on the air again. But they're not hard to grow. These are these are companion plants. Uh, they're small. They're herbs. You know, they don't get out of control. Um, you already already know about nettle. And, and the other side of this, too, is that as cannabis growers, you understand how to process plants. Mm -hmm. A lot of these people just, you know, farmers, they know how to grow stuff, but they don't know how to cure. And curing in cannabis is critical. Well, curing in herbology is just as critical. The way you dry it, the way you um, package it so that it doesn't lose the, the power that it has, uh, that it's pulled out of the earth. Uh, both in an energy and as far as uh, minerals and nutrients are concerned. So, you know, that's where you guys are, are a cut above a lot of these farms that are just mass producing, whether it's food or herbs or anything else, they don't have the curing part. They don't understand how to take care of that plant and make sure that it doesn't lose its effectiveness um, over the course of time, uh, after, after it's been harvested, mm -hmm. so I, you know, I can't stress that enough. And that's always been, you know, a big thing that, you know, Pauline was at the Dem Cure Hive meeting and, you know, she brought that out as a, as a thing, you know, to, for people to really start wrapping their head around. 
And when I heard from both Wendy and some other people up in Humble about the, you know, the devastating prices of, of <laughs> regenerative cannabis, huge nuggets, and they get three to five hundred dollars a pound. You go down to these freaking stores, these these freaking dispensaries that are supposed to be giving you good product, and it's little tiny popcorn nugs, and they're charging shit ton for it. And the second hit tastes like crap. So you know it's grown in salt. So I, you know, it's just it's it's such a frustrating thing. And I I truly believe that as the industry shakes itself out, because even the, the hundred acre farm up in Santa Barbara, they're not gonna make a huge profit. They flooded the market. They kind of fucked themselves because they put too much out there. So they're going to get pushed out of pushed out of the game. So it's just a matter of figuring out how to stabilize your income mm -hmm. long enough to keep you in the game. So you don't lose your permits. You don't lose your farm or all your hard work. And here's a great way of doing it. Um, you know, another one is garlic. Garlic's a critical one. Um, you know, it's not hard to grow. It really isn't. Um, and she's still working on this list over here, but uh, I didn't mean to go on a rant. <laughs> Tamara, why don't you why don't you comment on some of that stuff? Oh, I would love to. Like everything Pauline said about growing the herbs with the cannabis and how they're so needed. Like, yes, I am so much in agreement and alignment. And like, our there is a shortage of herbs. Like, as an herbalist, like I claim that you know, like labels and stuff, but it's like one who works with plants and, and makes medicine from them. The, last year there was, I couldn't find anything. Like I could not get a hold of the herbs I needed to make some of the medicines. And so I had to switch, which was really interesting and good. I had to find more natives, more things that I could wild harvest. But the more herbs we can grow, there's like, we can't grow enough. And so that is like a huge part of what we're doing. And like, even after I remember talking to Pauline, she was a huge, like, I was already on this thing. I'm like, I'm gonna grow tons of herbs and I'm gonna grow for my products. And I wanna, cause for me, cannabis is amazing medicine, but it's a catalyst for so many others. And when you put this other herbs together, different ones for different purposes, it, I mean, that is when the healing really takes place, I feel. And like cannabis is a huge, even the CBD between the ranges, you know, it depends like on the person, everybody is different. But you add that in and it's another element, it just activates it more. It makes the medicine, sometimes I feel stronger. Um, but we need more herbs. And I feel like the more we can make, it's also, a you know, the, there's just, we can't grow enough. You know, and I did put, I remember a few years ago when I first started in the DEM, I put a list out that I was looking for. And I'm, and like a couple of times I keep pushing and I'm going to keep pushing it too, because it's like, we need to create an herb collective within us. And there's a lot of farmers um, that are growing a bunch of beautiful herbs and are doing it in an amazing way on, in the DEM collective. So it'd be really amazing, I think, to create a DEM herb collective. Um, but yeah, if you can grow, the, and what I'm looking at is um, what are some higher price looking herbs that you can use that are also superfoods? I'd I look forward to hearing this list again because I know I've got this list from Pauline um, from before. But like I was looking at some others that I use for some of my products. Or what are the superfoods that I use daily? Like moringa. Moringa is an easy plant to grow. All you're doing is harvesting the leaves and you're making a powder of it. That's a superfood. And so stuff like this is like, and then also growing your um, at-risk herbs. Like there's um, golden seal, which is a really powerful antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial, you know, it's powerful. It's what I actually um, helped, I like the word cure, but I helped another body heal from staph, from a systemic staph infection with golden seal and honey. And those are powerful herbs. And then your ginseng as well. Like anything that's at risk, grow that because we need more of it in this world. There's reasons why it's at risk. People have taken it so much because it's so, so powerful medicine, but now it's depleted in the wild. So we're needing to grow these. Um, but yes, I'm looking forward to hearing your list again, Pauline. <laughs> okay. So um, all mushrooms, you know, dragonfly earth medicine is a good, Good is a good site to go on and see what they're growing because they're they're they have a five uh blend uh mushroom blend that's incredible and they're they're getting really good money 
right? So for 250, 300 caplets, it's 250 bucks. That's a good supplement for you right there. Mushrooms, right? So all must turkey tail, reishi, turkey tail is a, is a must. Reishi, uh, all mushrooms. Another one, for if you grow a tea, chaga tea. Chaga tea chaga is, is a mushroom. Is a mushroom. Chaga is also a mushroom, yeah. Um, garlic, you mentioned. We need garlic. I take garlic in, in right now for, for my... Um, for my protocol, um, for 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 this uh, new the, for these new infusions, uh, garlic quercetin. Um, quercetin is another one that uh, is is mitigate side effects of all cancer treatment mm -hmm. and cancer treatment. Nettle, neem leaf, um, and then something called this is new that I'm taking. It's called IP6. And this company, all right, to give you an example, this is pure, uh, but to give you an example of the difference between if you sell wholesale or if you sell it to a wholesaler that will retail it. So my the Genestein that I had been buying from a company, um, honey, can you get in the second drawer? There's a little bottle of Genestein so I can see where I get it from. I was buying this, you know, retail. Uh, 60 caplets for, um, I think 60 bucks. It's halfway back. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I take 24 a day, right? That's eight caplets a day. So you figure that's two grams a day, right? I was paying for 330 days worth $7,600 a year. Oh my God. Wholesale. I found a place that wholesales at a pharmacy uh, who also does for veterinarians, which is a great place. She's a wonderful person. It's a family owned, it's in, it's in New York. Um, and I'm not gonna give out the name right now because, because I'm gonna be selfish because I, <laughs> I really need my stuff right now. So I'll give it out when I get my stuff, you'll, you'll all get the name. But wholesale, I can buy it in powder for $2,600 for the same amount. Um, so this is the kind of markup you guys can get if you choose mm -hmm. to do it, right? So Genestein, this is Vital Nutrients. This this bottle is is fifty five dollars a bottle. I go through these. I go through ten of these bottles a month, right? Mastica, this is a new one that I'm taking, um, and this is actually from. It's called Kios Gum Mastic. And it's from the resins uh, material obtained from the pistachio uh, lentis lentiscus tree in Greece. Now, mm. I don't know how we're going to get that grown here, but that's something new that on um, that I'm taking that that is really powerful, and I believe it's it's helping tremendously. Um, and um, you know, all of these, for instance, the garlic will normalize your thrombin. Uh, the neem leaf will reduce regulatory T cells. Your IP6 will normalize your TGF, right? These are things that, that sound foreign to you, but to mm -hmm. people who really study and, and understand their, their cancer, they will know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, the... Um, they're bio biomarkers. Your mastica is going to lower your fibrinogen, and the nettle herb will normalize your CRP. And you know, when you're going through treatment, <clears throat> it's really important to be part of your treatment. You know, you don't just put your arm out and say, which is what most people do. And that's why when they when I walk in, they go, Oh God, here she comes. <laughs> because I ask questions. I want to know what are you putting in my body? Why are you putting a steroid in my body? And how do I mitigate the side effects of that steroid? Every week I get a steroid put in my body and that's just pummeling my immune system along with the chemo, right? So these are things that all of you as growers can think about, you know? I mean, how am I going to keep my business and how am I going to keep my plants and how am I going to keep my, my livelihood? This is a perfect way to do it and you're helping people to stay alive literally
what a what a beautiful thing, right? <laughs> so okay. Yes. Well Let said, Pauline. Mm -hmm. What right. is the what are those herbs doing in the body? Like when you take genistein and then um, the chaga teas and all that, is that just building your immune system? Is that feeding the this at your body at the cellular level? Yes. So so you know when I said it's normalizing my thrombin. It's it's regula it's it's regulating my my um my my um uh, uh, I'm sorry you know I'm, I'm a little just waking up so I'm not in my medical <laughs> my T cells right it's it's boosting my immune system it's helping my regulatory system my body to build its cells to fight this beautiful beast. That's what I call her, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't speak meanly to my cancer. You know, she's a gift. She came to me because I needed to change pretty drastically a lot of things in my life, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And in the last three years, I've, I've pretty much done that, everything. And now it's time, you know, that you know, she's saying, okay, I'm back. I'm showing you I'm back. There's a few things you got to do and I'm doing them. And, you know, she's, she's, she's listening, you know, she's, you know, and it's a really odd thing because when you have your body working in optimal, right? I mean, I was literally in the hospital last week. I went in, my hemoglobin was 0.6, was 6.8. My hemoglobin, your, that's your blood. Right? I had to get two blood transfusions. My iron was two. I shouldn't have been standing. Mm -hmm. My zinc was 50%. Right? And we won't even go into that. Talk about political. How they treated me because I didn't have mm -hmm. a COVID test was absolutely over the top. I should tell the story really quickly because this is what we deal with in the medical system right now. So I went in to the emergency room. I'm in, in, the, in, in, in the, the most pristine hospital in Beverly Hills at California. And walk in, and we were having a great time. My girlfriend was with me. Everybody in the ER was wonderful. They were laughing. We were, you know, I'm getting the transfusion. And all of a sudden they said, well, we need to admit you. You, have, you know, you, you're fine, right? You had vaccine. And I said, excuse me? They said, well, you need a COVID swab. I said, is it mandatory? And the nurse didn't answer me. And he said, mm -hmm. why, don't you want it? And I said, well, I would prefer not to get it. I have not had one yet, anything. And, I'm, and I stay by myself. I don't go out very much. And they said, well, you know, you, you, you need to get the, they said, okay. He said, okay, and he walked out. I said, well, okay, everything's fine. Two hours later, he comes back, whole attitude change. And he said, Miss Pauline, since you refused the COVID swab, I said, don't you put words in my mouth. I never refused anything. I asked you if it was mandatory. You didn't answer me. He said, well, since you refused the COVID swab, we are putting you on the COVID floor. I looked at him and I said, could you please repeat yourself? He said, well, since you refused the COVID swab, we're putting you on the COVID floor. I said, so you are taking... A person who's just about walking dead in your emergency room, and you're going to put me on a floor to, to make sure that I die? And he just looked at me, and he goes, and, and I said, fine, give me the fucking swab, just like that. And so he walked out, and now the nurses are coming in. Everyone's attitude has changed toward me, everyone. I am now the bitch in the room. And so... She, the nurse comes in and she, she opens the swab up and the head nurse comes in from the ER and looks at me and she goes, Miss Pauline, she goes, I said, listen, I'm okay. I'm okay with this. I'm fine. Let's do it. I'm, and this is how I talked. I was absolutely okay. I came to terms with it. I needed help. It, she said, you do want to get on the right floor, don't you? These were their words to me as I'm laying there vulnerable in their emergency room, just about dying. 
and tell them what they do. Oh yeah, and then they shoved, they shoved that thing so far up my nose and into my eye. I could feel it going into my sinus. I could feel it going into my eye. I can't read for more than 15 minutes at a time now. I can't see out of my eye. This is what's happening in our medical system. It's awful. I'm sorry to hear that happen to you. Yeah, me too. But I'm here and, you know, under the grace of God, I will remain here and I will fight this fight for all the people who don't know how. Because most people don't have my background. And most people don't understand that they have the, the best advocate is their body if they listen. And their best advocate is their voice. They have a voice. We can all say no. If we all just said no, right? No, this doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel right. I don't want to do this. I mean, 47% of our healthcare professionals are not vaccinated. What is that telling you? They know a lot more than we do. And I don't care if you're vaccinated or not. Do whatever makes you fucking happy. Whatever makes you happy, do it. But don't put it on me. It's not my job to take care of you. And it's not your job to take care of me. And that's how I feel. And so, you know, things are all falling apart and they have to. And now we can all put them back together. The regenerative, organic way. And that's my spiel. All right, I'm not going to cry anymore. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Fuck Bye. yeah, Elaine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I feel like tomorrow to, to talk more on what she was uh, getting into, I mean, what's weird to me is that no one really does talk about the immune system or how, how the body actually fights that. Um, and I, I do feel like that's something that um, as a family, you know, I believe we all have children on the show right now. So, uh, you know, we just want to pass on something, you know, as a, as a father, as a mother, you just want to give mm -hmm. your kids something better than you had. And I feel like a lot of parents today think that's material things when uh, a lot of the food that they're giving is just trash. Um, it's kind of like a second thought thing. I see a lot of uh, people even kind of eating on the go a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the main things I, I kind of get more back into like growing and stuff is it seems like that Hugo culture, like you're getting into, if you have a piece of land, you know, it might even be just like an acre or two. If you could just get, get a piece of land where you can do what you want with it without an HOA coming. Like that's where I live right now is HOA doesn't let you do anything. So it's kind oh, of like, wow. yeah, you have a, you have a house, but I still have a, in a weird way, like a landlord that lets me, um, I have to, you know, send a letter if I want to paint paint the uh, deck or something like that. So they don't really let anything other than golf course kind of things, uh, which is horrible, obviously, for the environment. So I wanted to go more into the Hugo culture side of things, getting more into what Pauline is saying. Like, what are some of those? Because once you've set that up, from what I understand, I mean, that could be a permanent thing. You could pass that on to your, you know, your children and your children's children kind of thing. So I was hoping uh, we could go deeper into that. Yeah, um, we'll go into that for sure because there's there's like deep meanings behind like why I know we set up the Hugo cultures, why I felt so passionately about it. And um, it really gets down to like we're growing. For me, the herbs are really about really about our health. And like I said, that's one of my passions is health. And it's like I feel like one of my probably my, my purposes here is to do but the thing is, too, is that I'm also fucking a radical about natural health. Like, I'm not into taking any over-the-counter shit. I'm into making my own, you know, products. I'm very much a radical. I don't go to the doctors. Like, my kids are so fucking healthy. And, like, we don't see doctors. I'm not opposed to it if it has to happen. But it's like, we just don't. And for me, that is because our immune system is strong. And I like, I made reasons why I live like on 120 acres with nobody around and like pure water coming out of the ground. And why the reason now I've got these hugels and it's like the better you can grow and put yourself in purity, the better your immune system is going to be. So for me, I had to learn 
how to grow on rock. Like I found my mountain sanctuary, but I have pure water coming out of the ground in a couple of places. I have three creeks running through um, and there's water that's coming out of the mountain, the Calistoga spring, like less than, it's like not even a half mile from my house. And then I have hot springs about 15 minutes from me. For me, water's fucking everything. And so when I was decide to settle down, I wanted a place that was like close enough to towns, you know, I could make it there, but it was all really about like, I want purity. I want to know like what I'm breathing, what I'm drinking, what I'm taking in is of the highest quality it possibly can be. And that's really hard in this day and age to have health. Like there's still like fucking planes that fly over me, you know, chemtrails going on. There's still all this stuff that we still have to deal with on a basis. So the Hugo cultures for me was this evolution of trying to figure out how am I going to grow on this piece of rock that I'm literally on. And, but I've got different pockets around. Like um, I have serpentine rock, like really heavy deposits of serpentine in certain places and others I don't. I have like more clay. And um, so I, uh, through it, it's like for me, I, I realized the Hugo culture was the way for me to really build soil. And if I'm building soil from my own land and like these materials, I know that I'm gathering and stuff that I know it's at the highest quality possible. And then that my food and my medicine is going to be of the highest possible like quality. And that's what I'm like. That's my objective is for my medicine and my food to like have nutrients in it again, because so much of our food doesn't have nutrients like you can eat like five tomatoes from the store and it is so not compared to when you eat your biodynamic, you know, fresh, like regenerative created tomato with all of its flavors and stuff in it. So, you know, I just, <laughs> wanted, I just wanted to comment on the Hugo culture because, you know, that's the thing is a lot of people don't understand. Hugo culture is built on top of the soil. A lot of people dig the holes and then bury it. And that's the exact opposite of what you want to do in a high clay soil because you're just building an anaerobic cauldron. So, you know, what you've done is amazing because you didn't have soil that would accept and hold moisture. You had rock, you went on top of it, which is, that's exactly where Hugo culture came from in, in the dramatic culture was that they build these things on top of the ground, plant them, take off for six months. And when they came back, there was this beautiful garden to harvest from and all the food that they needed. So that I just wanted to make that point to the audience so they understand how to use Hugo culture. Again, in, unless you test your soil to see how well it drains, you should not be burying the logs. You should be building a mound. So sorry, sorry to go on a rant. <laughs> uh, no, it's actually kind of funny because I have both at my place. And I've got reasons for it. So sometimes I feel like it's like dependent on like your environment and what you're working with. So for like the area that I found, I, I, so let me go back a little bit because my Hugo cultures was another evolution. I feel like as my property is evolving, I'm evolving too as a person. But like I first came out there and I built beds. I built eight by eight foot beds and that's what I grew all my cannabis in with these giant fucking eight by eight foot beds and one plant per. So I had this going on for a long time and I'd mix all my plants in and stuff. And, but I knew that I wanted to connect the beds somehow. And I hadn't really figured that out. I did not learn cubicultures in my permaculture class. I started understanding that I went to a couple of communities that had it and I just didn't really get it. Um, I was working on them, but I was just like, eh, no one could explain it to me. And it wasn't until I really got into our DEM circle and um, Moongazer were the people who uh, did my certification. And I was so excited because I wanted, I went into their Hugel and dug around, you know, and I'm like, oh, I gotta know all about this. This is it, this is what I'm gonna do. Um, but, and so I already knew I was gonna be connecting those beds in that one area. Well, then licensing happened and I found out that that garden, that right there, where I used to have all my cannabis, um, they wouldn't let me grow cannabis there anymore because it was too close to a runoff creek. But I could grow commercial food and commercial herbs and have my personal cannabis there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I kept it. And then I moved my medicine garden where they told me about 100 feet away and to this area. And I was going to do the same exact thing and just have the beds on top, you know, and um, start there. Well, 
after my first year growing, I'm like, I'm used to having really large plants, like really large. Like our thing was like, when we did our estimates, like our, it was around seven pounds per plant was the average. And that was like, you know, maybe some five, we even had 11 pounders. We would have like, we would always decide which is the biggest plant and like harvest that separately so we could see, you know, what it would yield. But like we had large plants. Well, that year I ended up having three pound plants and I was like, what the fuck? I can't do this. This was like 2017. And um, I realized what had happened is my plants were starting to go into the ground and then they just yellowed out, you know, when they're about to do that big stretch and they're like, yes, we're about to go for it. Well, my big ones started to do that and then they all yellowed out and they just stayed there. They stunted for the rest of the year. And I had to keep doing these like um, eggshell solutions to it. And I was giving um, eggshell, like the um, oyster shells powder and I was having to do that and I kept it and maintained it. Well, then that year after I had my soil test and I found out that that it was just all serpentine, serpentine rock and serpentine. If y'all don't know, it's um, it'll actually kill your roots. It stunts growth. And like there's only certain plants that can grow in serpentine soils. Um, and then not only that, but my soil was completely devoid of any calcium. So. I've got this garden now built and I'm like, fuck, this is like one of the worst places possible <laughs> to build this garden. And um, that's when I decided to go down. So in my garden last year is when we first did the Hugels and what we're calling the goddess garden. It's now the vegetable garden. And we can, we connected all of those eight by foot beds. We took it all down. We connected it with wood and stuff. I built up some of the others with some wood underneath kind of dug and stuck some stuff in there and made these beds and it, it's going amazing i love it and it was done more on top of the soil it was just right see I, I dug down like maybe two inches just to kind of break stuff up and and then start filling in and um and also i wanted in case the rains kind of come down there to dip a little bit and so that was that one well the medicine garden though i ended up going down and we dug down six foot feet in some areas and um, then we pulled out all this serpentine rock, like fucking boulders of serpentine rock. And then what I did is I went on the very bottoms of all of them and I had oyster shells that we had been able to collect a lot of from, um, we had a friend that used to work at a restaurant in Calistoga and on his way would bring all these oyster shells. We'd have boxes of oyster shells we get delivered sometimes daily at our gate. So I had a bunch of those and uh, we put a ton of those at the bottom and then just oyster shell powder and gypsum. And then on that, I kind of covered up where any more serpentine rock was with cardboard. And um, we also had to widen our roads and widening the roads. We had a lot of trees where we are. And so it was this really beautiful synchronistic thing where it was able to have these beds deep enough to put in all the dead trees and the stuff that we widened and really made um, made a defensible space around the gardens and stuff with all that. And so most of it was like just dead. And so we're able to backfill all those in there with that, um, all those trees and stuff from around the areas. And then I had horses for a couple years. And so I had enough manure to like, fill up almost like two feet. I couldn't even believe it. We still have horse manure. And then goat manure and alfalfa, I ended up bringing in some organic alfalfa. And um, yeah, so those beds I just have built up and that's going to be the medicine garden for this next year. But for me, I, and also in the area, like I'm in a, I'm, I'm growing like I did in a desert region. I'm so glad I learned how to grow in a desert region during my wolfing days, because this is what my land is now turned into. It's like more Mediterranean. It's just dry as fuck. And like we had hardly any rain this year. So what I'm seeing is the deep hugel cultures there. I'm not allowing them to go up because I kind of want it to go down just a little bit because I want the rain to come down. And it's also, I feel like it won't dry out as much during those really fucking hot days. And then what I've also noticed happening is I'm able to sink so much water right now. And it's right beside my well. And so I'm, I'm like rehydrating that landscape by having this so deep. And so I'm kind of curious on that experiment 
But this is why those were done so differently compared to, like you said, you really usually kind of build it right on top of the soil. So just kind of put that dirt for a cheat. Oh, that. That, was, that was beautifully <laughs> described and so well um, explained. Because, yeah, there are different needs or different methods or different uses for these methods. And, yeah, by sinking it in soil that's, that's draining, Beautiful. you're actually yeah. storing the moisture. And by putting it on top of soil that doesn't drain, you're not you're preventing things from going anaerobic um mm -hmm. and that was a really interesting talk of, on the serpentine because yes yeah, serpentine is a metamorphic stone um mm -hmm. and it tends to have qualities of high nutrition that can cause lockout mm -hmm. and the calcium cells love you girl that was fucking beautiful because we need more <laughs> calcium in our soils for sure so that was a great nugget there when you mentioned the manures, I, you know, if you have a little piece of land, you know, raising all those different animals, which one do you think gives the best ROI for uh, taking the time to care for those animals? Um, I, I think it's again on the depends on the environment. So for us, we've really been asking ourselves, like, are we sustainable? Are we really regenerative? And I had horses just because I love horses. It was an horse caravan. I'm like obsessed with horses. But like I have two farms. And so the farm that they used to be is more rolling hills and there's a lot of grass. Well, I had to bring them all over. I ended up consolidating after licensing, you know, should just hit the fan. I couldn't do two farms anymore. And so I subleased that out, but I brought my animals over. And so my horses, they don't have any grass. They, we've been like having to, you know, find organic stuff as much as possible and just like give them their diet. But for us, we realized they weren't sustainable. So just this year, we um, we had to give our horses away. And we also did the same thing with the goats. We realized the goats, they were just, um, it just wasn't working out. It wasn't sustainable. We were still feeding them. They weren't eating as much brush as we thought they would. They'd sleep on my porch. They got into how many cannabis gardens and ate all the plants, you know? <laughs> so, but I mean... Both of those produced a lot of poop. Like I had, that's what those gardens are filled with because we had animals for years. And like I never collected the horse manure because I knew I was going to do something really epic with it. So it was, there's so much of it. Um, and so that was a lot of poop. And, but now for us, what I've realized is I've gone now to bunnies and chickens. Hell yeah. Because my God, I had this, we were given two rabbits from our first wolfer. I did, I'll do a wolfing program at our place, which I absolutely love. And um, she found out, I was like, I was in this thing. I was like, I'm going to get bunnies now. And I'm going to have bunnies at each garden so I don't have to go and like run and collect it from a certain area. Because we have three gardens now on the property. We have where the medicine garden is. We have the goddess garden. And I have a big greenhouse. And so it's a, it's a big property. So I'm constantly going to the animal place, getting my manures for my teas or getting, you know, for top dressing or whatever. And I'm just, I'm over it. But bunnies, oh my God, those two bunnies took care of my whole greenhouse. And I, I was so impressed with how much poop that they create that <laughs> it was like, wow. And so that's like our new thing. And for us too, we have to look at like, that we evacuate almost every year down here in Lake County with the fires. And so to evacuate with horses and goats, it was fucking a nightmare. It was a nightmare, you know, because the horses and the goats, they definitely feel like when stuff's going on. So they don't want to go on those trailers. And it's always this big cluster. Whereas the bunnies and the chickens, we just put them in bins and took off. And so that was another reasoning for us, for our animals of like what animal produces will be good enough, you know, enough poop for us but also is sustainable on our land that we can feed most of it from. And that's when ours was bunnies, chickens, and we'll probably get a couple ducks. Um, so yeah, I think it's every different farm and what the environment is and what you have space for. And if those animals will also thrive because you want your animals to thrive too. So they have good poop and you just see you want a big, good synergistic, you know, farm, holistic farm happening. Now you've raised alpacas. No, no, oh. I haven't raised alpacas. Horses, goats, chickens, and bunnies. That's been, and, you know, a wide range of other animals I've picked up along the way, but those mainly, yeah. No, you for the, 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 you have the snails. Huh? Do you have, do you have pests, uh, snail pests in your farm? Because mm -mm. ducks are great to, to solve slugs, snails, anything like that. They That's just look cool. like, yeah, they eat pure protein, and yeah, that poop is crazy. 
crazy hot. Like chickens. that's awesome. Okay, cool. I, I definitely want. That's one reason I wanted to get ducks is so they could go around and maybe eat some of those uh, roly polies. Ryan's <laughs> 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 not gonna like that, man. Be eat them out no, of no, them. we oh. use a. Uh, mine are totally different. We have a. Uh, I have a does like designer isopods. So they're so pretty. I one. checked out your site. Yeah. I was like, oh my god! I didn't even realize I would. If actually they would like replicate them. as quick as the ones you're talking about, the little gray ones. I. I'd be a, you know, life would be super, super well, but no, um, the Cubara species, that's what this is, uh, was just discovered in Thailand in 2017. Uh, so it's a brand new roly poly. It's, it's really nothing to do with the ones that when we farm, uh, cannabis, uh, if, if you let them get out of control, we'll obviously start to take things down. Mm -hmm. uh, but I personally like even, um, using some of these, they're called dairy cows. They like protein more than, than other things, but using that to break down in the worm bins, uh, I've really seen that those are beneficial uh, isopods. So I feel like, you know, there's there's over a hundred different just Cubara species alone. Uh, so I feel like the the world of isopods has just started. So it's definitely something that uh, uh, I hope more and more people start to research and understand is because they are uh, organic matter decomposers. Um, and okay. when they're used in the right way, um, yeah, can really bene be beneficial, especially for worm farming. And, and just, qu just exactly. quickly, I, I'm randomly, I'm, I'm always like two minutes behind you. So like, you'll talk about your eight by eight raised beds. And that's why like two minutes later, you'll see me post them. So <laughs> you're always on to the next topic. But anyway, I just wanted right. to quickly show <laughs> some of your, so th this is the eight by eights, right? Kind of in general, mm -hmm. the concept. Uh huh. Yeah. And then this is biochar. You're making your biochar, but that's the. And, and then you had mentioned um, well, the uh, It's beautiful serpentine. land, by the way. So that's mm -hmm. what this one is. So this was an old mine? Yes, I actually have an old mine at my place, but like on my property, it's definitely been mine for other things too. Like I have an old mercury mine, but before that, um, I believe they said that there was gold and then there was, and that was piped. Like we have a big pipe that types into one of the springs that goes naturally and it would pipe down to the gold mine on the other property below me. And, um, but then there's also like place where they mine down to the bedrock. And that's that one picture you just showed that was just like the sliding landscape. And there, that's just bedrock. And so right there, and so I've been working, I talked to this environmental scientist that kind of came out and just do permaculture techniques and trying to figure out, you know, like, how do I rebuild this? And like one of, it's a really high hike up there. You know, I could do all kinds of stuff, but it's hard to get to. And so one of the biggest things is right here is you're just digging your foot into the ground, getting some native seeds, spreading around. See so if you find any more native grasses, kind of make a little compost with what's around and me and the kids just do that in the winter. We walk up there, and uh, like I said, it's pretty, you know, it's a nice hike up there. It's not like you could just carry a big old thing of straw or something on your back or anything up there. And so um, we've just been doing that for the last few years and trying to, you know, bring nature back and let her do her thing. <laughs> the goat. <laughs> yeah. And the, the land, yeah, and it's like got other places too that I haven't even made it to that I can see when I'm sitting up at the one part of a, a hill is that where you can see where dynamite, they were trying to check for pockets. And so there's just like been explosions on the land. So this land is like super mineral rich. It's got a lot of very different types of really cool minerals on it. It's really fun. That's another reason I really loved it. There was crystals everywhere when I went to the first time to go and see it and um yeah. <laughs> were they quartz crystals or were they other types? Mm -hmm. Yeah, different quartz crystals. And then it's kind of cool. You can see where um, lava has flowed over some. And so they're like kind of worked together and they're bubbly. And so that's really fun. And there's some obsidian. We found some um, arrowheads close to the creek. And yeah, it's a cool region. It's different. It's very rocky in some ways. And then on the other side, you've got like moss growing up trees. So you have two almost different environments on this place and this property that for me, I keep thinking like, um, I will eventually do grow some reishi on the side of the mountain. Maybe that's where I grow some of my ginseng, you know, some of these more at risk herbs that need the forest and some of the mushrooms. So it's pretty fun. I love it. Yeah. It sounds like you got a really badass place up there. It's just, beautiful. yeah. 
I mean, that's you know, and having the two different environments, uh, that's not something that most people get the opportunity to have on their property. You know, usually you're either you're in a valley or you're on a mountainside, but you're not getting both those extremes of, you know, because the water's all dumping on the other side of that mountain, creating that mm -hmm. mosses and on, this, on the other side, it's dry and barren. Yeah. And you're doing all the right things with how to how to deal with that. And and I love the fact that you're planting native plants and trying to reestablish the, the vegetation, which will then in turn bring in more Mother Nature's components. So beautiful work, sweetie. Beautiful work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, for I was gonna say you've got quite a fucking life story there. <laughs> yeah. I was not I, uh... prepared for it. <laughs> yeah, I definitely feel like I get a little confused because I feel like I've lived at least this is like my fourth lifetime already out here and on this planet. And there's been a lot of I've changed who I am like several times this existence. But now I'm seeing in my 40s how all of that really is all merged and become part of who I am and why it all feeds into each other. Whereas it was like, my healer friends were like, why are you farming now? We're so confused. But for me, it was like this mixture of like, of course I'm farming. Of course I'm learning how to grow my own food and herbs because I want my health. I want my health for my kids. And so it's just been like this really, um, yeah, it's been quite a ride. <laughs> well, you, know, you know, I'll be honest with you. Uh, you know, I, I talked to my children about this and, and others. You are a sum total of all your experiences. So every experience that you do, whether it's nursing, whether it's working in a mailroom, working as a clerk, it doesn't matter. They all build into themselves eventually. And you f come to find out that those experiences that you thought were worthless actually become valuable at some point in your life to help you transition into another part of it. So it's, you know, that's why I said something, because that's just, you know, a, a, an example of how cool um, diversity can help a person. And so instead of like getting locked into one thing, expand, explore, try other things, try different jobs, try different plants. Um, you know, and that's, I think that's the real lesson, you know, for today is that, you know, again, you are a subtotal of your experiences. So the more experiences that you have, the better off you are and more prepared you are for this crazy fucked up world 2021 <laughs> has become. You know, for sure, for sure. I also feel like legalization was hard. Like it was fucking hard transition for us. And um, like we I was ready to go and like we lost it all. We had you know, we had a lot of theft that year and um, the peers, you know, people got raided and all kinds of shit, but we lost it all. And so when we were ready to go into licensing. I was at a point where I was like, fuck, I have no money none i put all my eggs in one basket going okay here we go let's do this and it just went got wiped off the table and i had to let my teams go I had two teams at two different farms we had to let them go and it was like me and my manager who is now like um a co-owner in the business she's like stuck with me through it all and i realized i was like fuck what are we gonna do okay i'm gonna have to consolidate i'm gonna have to grow this herb i had gardeners you know and i was overseeing things i was making products i was kind of being mom i had just had a kid and so i had to step really back into that role which was what i've realized has been one of the best things that's really happened for me because it's i mean legalization and I like almost losing everything because it really made me get clear on what my priorities were and me made me re-remember like who i am like i got so caught up in just growing cannabis and farming for so long that i forgot there's this whole other aspect of healer to me and like plant talker and you know just energy worker and i re-remembered that part of me during a lot of this and then i started realizing that my interest i'm very dedicated to cannabis i feel like i'm one of her she's my most powerful ally but i've realized that the other plants were starting to talk with me as well and that i'm really interested in that and that i'm interested in sharing with people what i know and what i've picked up and what i've learned and so it's become this transition where now as I'm going, I'm still working on our license. Like I have, I've got all our study, you know, all I have to do now is turn in our application after we get some more funds for that. But it's like, I'm not taking it as fast as I thought I had to make everything happen because now our medicine garden is getting turned into a commercial herb garden as well. 
So the beds I did, not only are they six feet down, they're like 12 feet across. <laughs> and then I kind of closed it in to so now where it's eight feet, but there's still growing room underneath because I want to grow a lot of herbs. And like the Moringa, the neem, the neem is another one that can grow in my climate into bushy, but I want the neem leaf, so it's perfect. So I'm looking at different plants that are actually going to bring in a profit that are also like really medicinal, the ones I want to use in my products, the ones that cancer patients definitely need, you know, the ones that are really needed. And so that's why I've expanded that garden. And during this transition, I'm not sure if I was just getting caught up in legalization, if I would have gone as full force as what I am doing now. And so I'd have to give thanks for, you know, everything falling apart so we could come back together. And I'm really happy. Like I took all my gardens down and redid them. And now we have like at least five times as much space to grow. And um, they're going to be way healthier plants. There's going to be more water conservation. And so, yeah, I just kind of have to give thanks for those like crazy parts in our journey that we're like, fuck, but, you know, really makes us who we are and helps us like re-remember that. And so on the land too, not only the reason we have three gardens, the reason I didn't move just the cannabis garden over, I knew at that point I was like, the goddess garden is now being transitioned into our education demonstration permaculture garden, where it's like we've held our first workshop out there. I hold workshops constantly for little ones, for the wolfers, you know, to show them how to do everything. And because we're teaching at the same time that we're doing this work trade, that's the thing about wolfing is that we provide um, like shelter, camping, a, a kitchen, some foods and education in exchange for their work. And so I love this dynamic. And so that's becoming this teaching gardens. And I left the aisles really wide so I could have like a classroom in the middle of these aisles. And um, so that, that garden's really transitioning right now. And then on to the medicine one this next year. And uh, I'm just really excited for that and beautiful. I'm just happy for the transition as well and to where we're going. The universe hard at work, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. Always bring something good out of it. Yeah, for sure. Hey, Josh Eddington, I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Uh, why don't you follow uh, Pauline on Instagram, Pauline Coinus? Um, because thank you. That's a, a wonderful gift, my friend. Appreciate it. Um, so where is uh, where are you in legalization? You have to uh, go ahead and file your final permit, and, and then you're done? Because I've, yeah. I've, I've seen so many people go through this hell of regulatory where – as soon as they get through this hoop, then they're like, oh, well, now you need to have an Indian study or now you need to have a water study. And it's like an endless chain of bullshit regulatory nonsense where they're just milking these poor farmers out of the money. Uh, have you been through all that shit now? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's why it's taken so long. And one of the reasons, too, is because I was determined to fund this myself without bringing in investors. I got one loan from a friend and then he couldn't really do it. So <laughs> I was like, I've just been funding each thing at a time. Like we had our archeological study, we've got the water board I've had since 2016. Like I was ready to go. And then we had um, the fishing game, it just got done. I had to redo that fucking permit. This was like the fourth time because they kept switching. They're like, oh, I had to turn it in. I mailed it in, they're like, oh, it's online now. I did the online, they're like, oh, this is the wrong one. I had to do it over and fucking over. And so that's finally done. I've had the biological study, you know, and that was like, what, 3,500? It's like all these things were so fucking much. And um, so now, and the site plan and everything, and now we've kind of changed the garden. So I, that's the last thing I really need to do is refinish up um, the site plan because we're also able to do manufacturing out. That's one cool thing about Lake County is they're allowing level one, the non-volatile manufacturing on rural land, as long as you uh, your roads are commercial standards. And so that was a big thing I had to do this spring, was get my roads 20 feet across. Um, and that I have a couple more things I'll have to do with that, but that was a huge expense. So now I'm at a point where, yeah, it's like now I have to come up with another, I think it's about seven grand for my permit. And um, because I'm doing self-distribution, we're doing level one manufacturing and we're doing a 10,000 square foot garden and a cottage greenhouse. 
And so there's a lot on just that one property and I have to have it all kind of done. So, but that's where we're at. And then as I was ready to kind of like, okay, I've got the money together, I've, I've collected it. We are well caught on fire this year. Like literally went up in flames. I, we had our electric redone so that it would not be sketchy looking going towards the well. And I was like, oh great, now I'm gonna feel real confident. We didn't even use our well this year um, because I have two 50,000 gallon bladders. I have 100,000 gallons of water that I store in the winter to use all year. And so luckily I had those and our well wasn't in use, but we got it hooked up. And the same day it was hooked up, luckily I was in the garden because it caught fire. And so we didn't have a well for months and we just actually got that redone, refixed. And now it's super legit and it's running really well. Uh, but that went all my permit money. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's cute. those kind of things keep happening. So that's where I'm at. I'm just like, I'm one step at a time, you know, I'm doing it. And now I'm not in a rush because I'm like, I'm growing herbs. I can have, and also that I have enough stuff that is like providing us, you know, I, I like what I've learned to do because I heard this from a permaculture teacher before is like have seven different, every farm should have seven different forms of income. And so for me, I've been working this last couple of years to not rely on just the cannabis as I've had for our overhead. And so that's been slowly building up with the products that I make. And it's all been word of mouth because we've still been working on the website and all that jazz. But um, that's now at a place where it's supporting us. And so I feel good about going into like the commercial herb garden. Hopefully next year we'll have our license. But if not, we'll probably do um, hemp and CBG because I want to do that. Um, and along with the other herbs. So, yeah. And then the, I mean, the eventual plan is to get my other property ready to go for hemp and um, CBD flower and the CBG and some other things I want to play with there. But that farm, I'm, I've been, I've been holding on to it because I know what I want to do there. It's rolling hills. I think it'll be a good environment. I had the people there put in fuels the way I designed and um, getting it all prepared for that. And then this farm where I'm at, be able to have the uh, 10,000 square foot cannabis grown within the commercial herb garden. And we'll have the cottage greenhouse. It's mainly gonna be our one-to-ones and, and different stuff that I use for products that I need more consistently. And then we'll have our manufacturing and be able to do um, tinctures and solves. And I do a lot of face care products and um, RSO. We do a lot of RSO, the ethanol extraction, and we do a really good job on it, I feel, and um, I'm really passionate about that medicine. So that's another like, one we're going to be doing. <laughs> yeah, that RSO, man. If you if you have to buy it at a dispensary, it is ridiculous. You, you can't, yes. well, nobody can afford to do it. And so it's. It, I'm so glad that you're going to be, you know, making more of it. Um, it's been a lifesaver for Pauline. And yeah. You know, I've been blessed that um, the people that we get it from are both regenerative organic, um, but they're not raping us. They're charging us, you know, a few dollars a gram, which is more than affordable. Um, and then it also allows her to help her friends and, and, you know, clients by making it extremely affordable to them instead of this, you know, $80 a gram or some bullshit that the, the dispensaries charge. Mm -hmm. you know, keep up the good work, girl. You're, you're, you're just fucking killing it on all sides, which is beautiful. And, you know, what a great representation of hard work and dedication and not getting pissed off and frustrated, not being entitled, you know, taking the punches, man, going with the lick. <laughs> but, you know, big ups, too, man. Big ups. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, uh, I definitely realized I had a little bit of an ego after, you know, during the cannabis time and, that's been kind of fun to get rid of, you know, because I was the little girl in Lake County who grew 10 pound plants and I was kind of known for that in my circles. And then like everyone knew I was going to be one of the first people to get my license and it didn't happen. And like every shit, all the shit fell apart and then my plants were little and like it just, it was beautiful though. You know, you have that crash and you're like, wait, who am I again? What am I doing? <laughs> Why am I on this planet? <laughs> so yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> Amen to that, man. Amen to that. I wouldn't. I would never be on the journey I am on if it wasn't for a horrible divorce and losing everything. I mean, literally everything. Um,
but that's that's what it takes. But you've got to be the person to stand up and deal with it, and not curl up in a ball yeah, and say, "Woe is me," which you see too many of those people nowadays. So you know, it's the it's the lessons, it's the life lessons that really galvanize you uh, into what you become later on in life. So you know, good again, beautifully said. Beautifully yeah, that's said. Fine. I. I Passing <laughs> passing on those Hugo cultures eventually to your children, like if you just kind of maintain that, is that something, you know, that, that they're going to be able to to run with in their life or is they're going to have to rebuild that, you know, 20 years from now? The way that I farm and I think most people do with the Hugo cultures is like every year you're adding more, like because – I know that they'll even be better in that generation as long as everything's kept as it is. I do tons of cover crops. I go by this philosophy I heard. It's like, mama don't like to be naked. And so right now my gardens aren't there <laughs> because my cover crops didn't take this early spring because we had no rain. Um, but usually there is not a single place on my soil that is like open. And so I love chopping and dropping. I do four major chop and drops every year. And that really, you know, that builds it up. It keeps building up. You're always having that. And then I love doing the top dressings with the bunny manure. And so I top dress with that and that just keeps building soil. And then before we go into a big year, I have a compost pile, you know, we're adding to that. I love, I'm starting to do the IMO three this next year and adding that on. And so it's just that's like you have your certain things that you just keep up with. And so it just keeps rebuilding that. It's not like you ever it's it's not like it's there and that's it. You know, it's like it's a continuous thing like nature. You know how her leaves just fall continuously. And it's just like this cycle of building and plants coming up and dying. And so that's the cycle of it. And so the intention is for it just to get better and better. And then I left some of the oyster shells really whole. Like some of them we like, we like pounded down and I also got the powder, um, but I left a lot of them whole because I know it's going to be like five generations, you know, down the road, maybe that seven generation that I'm for my family that that's actually going to break down. And so that calcium is going to be there. And so I've thought about that as we're building this and I am wanting to leave a legacy for my children. Like they want to be part of this great, or at least like, you know, they'll have income from it or, I feel like my youngest is going to be um, the one that comes up and kind of takes this over from me. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's the, that's the goal. I mean, beautiful, sustainable land and homestead that, you know, we can raise our families on and that's about freedom and sovereignty and, you know, being out of the Babylon system. Yeah. Well said. We could yeah, definitely well go down a lot of those roads. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, and Brian, just to just to you know pound that home is that yeah, what she's doing will last generations. Um, you know that's why sometimes it's best to look at the tree species that you're that you're using in your Hugo cultures. A really good hardwood's going to last a lot longer than a softwood, um, but that's not to say that you can't continuously add to it like Mother Nature does. So you know again, there's no one right way uh, to build these. It, you have to use common sense. And understand what you're building on and what is your goals. What are you trying to achieve? But um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that, that that Hegel keeps coming up because you know a lot of people just don't understand or they've heard one way and there's so many different ways. Yeah. Or it's all about building soil. That's the goal. I feel like a lot of people maybe try to do this with not the full A to Z understanding, and then they just kind of, to be honest, kind of shit on it. Like they're like, ah, oh, that doesn't really work the same way. I'm trying to get yields. Um, but I appreciate you, you know, taking the time to to break all of this down because I feel like if you're real organic living soil type farmer, how are you not farming for the future and hopefully teaching your children? I mean, that's mm -hmm. I feel like that is um, the, the, at least for my family the American dream to be able to have a piece of land like you do outside of the the norm and the HOA and all the things I had mentioned where you can decide what you want to do with your property and you can continue to improve it year after year, uh, which I feel like is just something that that's your little slice of heaven that you, you got up there. And, um, you know, a lot of us are, are continuing to hopefully uh, achieve that as well. Um, so again, just shout out to the, the piece of property is gorgeous, obviously. And the fact that you're able to continue to improve it um, is just going to be, you know, when you see your little kids running around, I, I feel like that's got to be like, the most fulfilling thing in life is just to be like, all right, things are improving for our family. And that's 
really all that matters. Yeah, for sure. I think one of my favorite things is to have my little one out there harvesting herbs with me and her identifying them. And like me going, what is that one? Go get me some rosemary. Go get me that motherwort. And her knowing at like now she's seven of what that is. And that right there makes me cry. I'm like, yes, do it. You know, because I was raised in Babylon. I didn't know any of this shit. And so it's just really fun to be able to pass that on. And even my son, who was raised in rainbow gatherings and horse caravans, and now he's like electronics kind of person he still knows about health and he still knows how to compost and all this other stuff that he will not ever admit to, but he knows how to do it. And so I love that. That's great. <laughs> well, yeah, really remember, <laughs> they're going to teach other people too. And, and your son yeah. is going to run into a situation where he needs it <laughs> and he's going to go, Oh man, I really owe mom a big hug and thanks for this. <laughs> That's what happened. My my favorite was like, he was always telling me, he's like, I don't need to learn how to grow food. There's grocery stores. I'm like, well, what if there are no grocery stores? Exactly. You know? And he'd be like, whatever, mom, whatever. And then our grocery store burnt down. Like it literally burnt down in, the, in Middletown. And I was like, see? And he was like, oh my God. And like, it took us so far. Cause like we're in Middletown. So it takes us about an hour to go to another grocery store. And so we had, we started growing a lot more food and he was like, well, I want some corn. I want some, maybe some beans, you know, <laughs> and so that was a really fun and like, you know, kind of thing that happened. Not that that was fun that that happened, but it was like, is it? That's so, an aha moment. Life lesson for sure. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I told you. <laughs> what if there are no grocery stores? What if there is not? You know, what if there's no gas? And that's why for a while I was like, that's why we got horses. So we could go to town if we need to. But, you know, we can maybe bread our bikes, so we'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I, to be honest, I don't know how deep, but I feel like if there's no gas and there's stuff, there's, there's such chaos that you probably wouldn't ride your horse through that anyway. Right. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's, the, the reality is I think that a lot of shit would be going off for weeks until probably uh, things so. kind of settled down. But, uh, yeah, that's um, – I feel like, again, why we want to we got to do things and, and improve our life the way that we take hold. And I feel like understanding how to grow food is yeah. definitely a skill set uh, that's going to be in high demand. I feel like for our children and our children's children, because it doesn't seem like anybody really gives a shit outside of certain little circles and that kind of stuff uh, where their food comes from. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of my peers that, you know, definitely have enough money to, to purchase whatever they want and they eat McDonald's and stuff. And you kind of ask them like. Yeah, you know, like you have everything in life, material things, and you don't focus on your food. And that's something that I feel like I, I even noticed, like once I started fasting and stuff, like I almost mm -hmm. feel like you're um, like, wh what is that basically? Like the purpleness and underneath your eye um, kind of tells like, all right, there's something deficient going on there. And I personally learned that I was uh, low on zinc. So I feel like that's mm -hmm. a gold nugget for a lot of people out there that uh, want to be able to improve their immune system. Uh, I'm learning that basically your body can't hold on to zinc. Like you need to be able to have that um, every day or every other day. Uh, so I promise you, if you improve your zinc uptake, uh, just do like 50 milligrams a day. Uh, you're going to see a definite improvement on that. Also with the uh, the purpleness under your eye. Uh, so uh, health tips, I guess, as well on the Future Cannabis Project. But um, when you're feeling good as a farmer, like you had mentioned before, tomorrow, I feel like uh, once I started to improve and focus on what I was eating, I forgot how good you could actually feel. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that was something where I was like, oh, yeah, like I did used to be able to kind of like work out a little bit stronger, or go a little bit longer on things. And I don't know, for for, for me, I guess, and I kind of have maybe that same journey that you were talking about. Now I want to go even deeper on that. Like I'm watching all these videos late at night. Uh, you had mentioned water. I, I watched a, like a small little documentary last night alone uh, where this kind of like um, – gentleman that I guess some people regard as like a guru uh, was talking about how the, you know, the human body 72% of water. And so you really need to focus on that for your children as well. Like uh, think about the kind of um, cup and that kind of stuff that you're putting the water in when you give it to your kid. And God forbid, if you're giving them juice all the time, and mm -hmm. it just made a lot of sense um, to me later in life where I felt like growing up in Georgia, nobody talked about health whatsoever. And I've, I feel like I missed that. And, uh, I just want to, I guess, give that to the community that if you could focus on food, you are going to feel amazing. Uh, I promise you that. And I think the important thing is food, food grown responsibly. 
You know, the reason we're mm -hmm. deficient in zinc is because we don't have the biological interaction of the food production. All the food's produced by feeding the plant, not feeding the soil. So that's mm -hmm. why all of us are suffering from these crazy health fucking issues between immune disorders. And dude, when I grew up there, nobody was allergic to peanut butter, right? You know, I, there was no kids, you know, friggin' with cancer. There was none of that shit. And nowadays, you know, it's all around you. It's so in your face. It's not funny if you pay attention. But if you blindly go along focused on possession, not giving a shit about what you're eating, then, you know, your head's buried in the sand and you're never going to notice what's going on around you. So, you know, that's, again, one of the reasons why I love them pure is because they're teaching this to everybody mm -hmm. freely about why it's so important to grow your own food and grow it responsibly without any synthetic inputs, using banker plants, using trap plants, using polyculture, using hugoculture, using all these things to build the health of the soil so that what they're getting in return is healthy things to consume. So thank you so much Mark, for, for, for coming on today and, and, you know, being a part of that message um, for the audience and, and hopefully they all hear. Yeah, most definitely. I also feel like about growers and our, and us cultivators is that we take such good care of our plants that we forget to take care of ourselves sometimes. And so to remembering to give yourself that nettle tea, that horse tail tea, where are you feeding that plant? Like give it to yourself. Irish sea moss is like a huge one that I'm a huge proponent for because it's got like 98 minerals and the vitamins that your body needs daily. And so if you're able to take that with some burdock root and some bladder whack, you have all the minerals and vitamins your body needs for that day. And if you're able to get that in in a smoothie once a day, you know, twice a day is great, but like once a day and get some tea in you, you're going to feel so much better and you're going to be able to take care of your plants and yourself better. And, um, yeah. Hey, wh what did one. you say after the burdock root? Sorry. Um, bladder whack. Bladder whack. Mm -hmm. All right. It's, it's weird. It, that's yeah. <laughs> Look at you go, Brian. You're going to get all down this rabbit hole. Man, I'm telling you I'm on the health because I, I, I really do mean that, man. I forgot how good you can feel if you just focus on health, being outside, all the little shit that sounds like, yeah, all right, whatever. Uh, but when you add all those little pieces up, um, and the main thing too is fasting. I mean, I talk yes. about that almost every show now, but fasting to me is what changed my life to see like, um, all right, you you can, all the bullshit in your body, all that kind of stuff. If you take the time to fast and again, you have to build up to this. I'm not saying like go fast for three days. if You've never done it before, uh, but just even going 12 hours. Uh, is beneficial. And then see if you can get to 16, 18. Um, and if you can get to 18, you could probably start to live your lifestyle at 18, six, uh, where you're obviously not eating for 18 hours. And then you're eating in that win six hour window. And at first, um, I feel like just focus on your, your I will, I, I want you to go more into this, but if you, when you are going into the fasting aspect of it, I noticed, and it seems like a lot of people on YouTube and, uh, people that I admire on YouTube are saying that one of the main reasons that people have issues with that is because they don't focus on the, the small trace minerals, uh, mostly also on zinc and potassium. So their electrolytes get off uh, when they're mm -hmm. fasting and they feel like they feel horrible. So when I've been doing this kind of stuff, I, I make sure that the potassium is up on point and the zinc is up and I am able to go like a few days. The longest I've personally gone is four and a half days. Um, so I was hoping that you could talk more into that because I feel like that is another almost like a door to Narnia for health. And it's free as long as you have the the sacrifice and the discipline to kind of get into it. And I feel like if if you are one of those kind of people that are diving in, you know, I got notes here that you've been talking all day and you just get into um, trying to to learn and educate yourself on uh, this is another level uh, of being able to take care of yourself. And again, it's free. All you got to do is stop feeding your face. Uh, and you're going to see dramatic benefits. Uh, so I, yeah. I guess I hype that up too much. But if you could go into the benefits of herbs with fasting. Yeah, definitely. Um, herb. I mean, fasting has definitely been a huge part of my journey. I, I definitely experimented with a lot of different fasting. I was in a raw food diet for years. But I, what I realized is I got into this place where I was ready just to cleanse and cleanse and cleanse. And so I started with the like the 12 hour fast and then like just every once it's one once a week, you know, for a full day. Um, and then I got to where I did like that master cleanse with the lemon juice and maple syrup and cayenne pepper for the 30 days. 
And that was probably one of my favorites. You wanted to take like an herbal laxative with it. Um, but that was like what the best I've like, I felt like I was flying. Like it was so beautiful and amazing. Um, now I'm a lot more gentler. Like I don't just do that. Like when I fast myself, I do the lemon juice, which I love and the cayenne. Sometimes I'll do the maple syrup because that has your, some minerals and vitamins in there. And it kind of keeps so your, some of your sugar level up. So you don't have like that full <laughs> crash and that detox moment where you're kind of shaking um, that you can have. But teas, nettle and horsetail are huge. Um, raspberry leaf because the calcium inside of it. So those are three. Um, some vitamin C with some rose hips. Um, I'm thinking about the tea that I take daily and that I use. And this is um, some dandelion root because that's going to cleanse your, love, your liver. Um, milk, milk, milk thistle seed as well. So your liver and your kidneys get cleansed with your dandelion, your milk thistle. And then um, you have some nutrients you want to go in there with like your nettle and your horsetail. So you're having cleansing herbs and you're having nutritive herbs. And then I love the raspberry leaf. It helps balance your like, especially with women, our estrogen, our hormones, but also it's really high in calcium. Um, so those I like to take. And then if you have a little bit of honey, it kind of adds, you know, it helps with the, you know, maintaining that balance so you don't just crash. So that's usually how I fast now. Um, sometimes I'll do juicing, but juicing takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. You know, you got to have that time for it. Um, but I, I like just kind of keeping a balance with those herbs of having like a balance of cleansing and nutritive herbs. So, but yeah, fasting is powerful. Wait, get, let's go also get to the, like, speak again about the water. Because, you know, most of the time when you're doing this, you're <laughs> drinking a lot of water. And I personally believe that there's a dramatic difference between like Dasani water and uh, water that's coming from like a, a, a mountain source. Uh, so let's kind of, uh, Leighton, I want to, you know, bring you into those conversations, but I, let's get deeper into water because I don't think people realize how important that is to your plants as well as to to yourself. And uh, I guess the theme of today is, you know, when you're feeling good, I just feel like when you're walking into the grow, uh, just life is better in general when you yourself are feeling better, less stress. Uh, and I, I promise a lot of that stress is coming from you not having enough potassium and zinc. Um, it's just you're drained. Your adrenals are fucked up. Um it's hard it's hard to bounce back on that without you focusing on it well you know let's talk about water um we used to drink groundwater so there was this amazing study done at rodale um i talk about the movie or the documentary called symphony of the soil and i think everybody should watch it and once you watch it once you're going to want to watch it again but in the middle of the the hour and 20 minutes uh, there's a demonstration done at Rodale where this gentleman takes four bottles, um, a plastic bottle so you can see through them, fills it up with four different types of soil. The far right is a pure organic system. The far left is a pure conventional ag, you know, salt based uh, grow. So he takes 100 mils of water, he pours it in the top of the bottle and you watch it go right through the soil on the on the conventional farming and the mm -hmm. soil and the water is dark. It's it's cloudy. It's silty clay um on the other one and and a pretty much like 98 percent of the water comes through on the conventional so that means the water's gone it's mobile and on the far right one in the conventional system he pours the water in and only a few drops of water come out the bottom and it's crystal clear so that's the biology filtering the water right mm -hmm. but we destroyed all of our groundwater because of introduction of synthetic chemicals, tractors, you know, heavy, heavy uh, manure loads from, you know, too many horses, too many cows, whatever. Um, so we could no longer drink the groundwater or the stream mm -hmm. or the rivers. So then we started drilling wells. And every time you drill a well, you punch a hole in that beautiful filtration system that's mineralizing that water. So as the water slowly goes back and forth between the cracks of these rocks all the way down into the aquifer, it has been mineralized, right? So now you start sucking all that mineralized water that took years to get down there out in days or hours or minutes. And the worst part about this is you've actually created the ability for the surface water to get directly down into the ground or the aquifer around the casing of the pipe that was drilled down there. So we've poisoned all our aquifers. So what is water? 
it's it's a scary thing, and we do not talk enough about it. Now, there was a gentleman I met in the late 80s down on Cape Cod who had de devised a method of using biology and plants to filter out water, uh, filter out manures, uh, you know, um, chemicals, synthetic fertilizers, by using these series of tanks where the water flowed from one to the next, to the next, to the next. As a matter of fact, out here, um, his son built a giant scale uh, product project. Uh, it cost him, I think it was $2 million, but they have 250 homes plus the Limonera uh, processing packing plant. All the water that they use goes through this system and then they take the clean water and spray it out on that. And so, you know, that's what we should be doing for our water. We shouldn't be making municipal water, pumping it with chloramines, which are detrimental to your body and your biological health, bottling water in plastic and shipping it all over the world. Uh, it's not a fucking, it's not a renewable source. I mean, you know, where is it coming from? A lot of the water that's being sold in, in bottles is actually just run through an RO system, which is even worse. Now you've stripped any little bit of mineral that was in there. So how do you fix all this shit? It's a challenge. We, we have so many people and so much infrastructure. And, you know, you're up there in that farm and you've got access to that mineral rich water. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. But us people down here in Babylon, man, we're fucked. I mean, you know, you're, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And so it's, it's, it's a challenge. And so how to make clean water. And I've got hit up a bunch on Instagram. If you look back, there are some really cool contraptions that people have invented over the years, basically using soil to filter water and you pour it in the top and it takes time, but the water comes out the bottom and you drink that. And you're using again, rocks, sands, minerals, mm -hmm. It kind of goes back to the horizontal soil system where you build that, that E horizon on the bottom, which is all mineral, but that sand filter prevents the organic matter from the top from getting down and then going anaerobic as it sits in the bottom. So there, there are a lot of ways that we can do this as, as a species. Um, the problem is we're, we're so wrapped up and we don't have time. You know, we don't have time to grow our vegetables. We don't have time to clean our own water. But there are ways to doing it if, if you know, people are interested. You just got to do your work, man. Do your diligence. But the information is out there. So that's Tomorrow, what are your thoughts? Oh, my bad. Um, yeah. I mean, my thoughts are very much in that. That's one re main reason. I One of the reasons I went left Babylon was water. For me, water has always been this, like, crazy, intrinsic part that I'm very passionate and um, about. In fact, like when I used to travel my bus, there was a, there's a website called findaspring.com that we would travel to. And that's where I'd get our water and I would store it in like five gallon jugs, glass jugs on the bus. And that's where we drank from. And we would just kind of go around to those, that and hot springs. <laughs> that was like my thing. Um, and so for me living where I'm at, another thing too, just like what he was saying with the well water. I don't use so much of my well, like especially for the gardens. And I really, one of my goals is to get off of groundwater. I feel like that's mama's earths and those are her veins. And when she's ready for that water to come up, it spirals up out of the earth. And that's how she recleans herself. That's how she invigorates. That's the water we need to be drinking as those springs um, because it has spiraled in. And like what that does is it neutralizes any toxins and it makes it alive again. It makes water is actually, you know, alive. And so that is the technology when I do have to go to cities and I'm in cities for a while is I use, um, I use a Berkeley filter. That one's okay. A Berkey. And, uh, but there's a new one. I was just looking up the name of it that I want to actually travel with. And it's one that it filters and totally it's an amazing filter, but then it re um, invigorates that water through crystals. And then it makes it come alive again. So you're not only taking out that chlorine and whatever that nasty stuff is, you're re-alivening again because that's how water comes alive is by putting it in motion. That's why the springs and the creeks are clean is because it's constantly running. And um, But, yeah, those are my, like, thoughts of water. For me, we're really trying to get off any groundwater um, with the 100,000-gallon bladders I take from wearing water. I have a um, – we take some from the springs because I have a – an old mining um, water right. 
And, but we just take in the winter and that way we restore it in those bladders. And then I like to take it through those invigorating type of spouts to filter. And that's like one of the next investments I want to make for the garden is like a really big agricultural one because then it just livens that water back up. Um, but yeah, you know, water is huge. The other thing is oxygen. Um, that's, that's what that churning does is it builds the DO in the water. The, the parts per million of water we're drinking out of um, tap water is like eight parts per million. Yeah. Um, we really should be drinking rainwater, which is 25 parts per million oxygen. Mm. That's what's really going to help our biology. Um, from, from So think about it this way. The bacteria uses the oxygen to do its metabolic processes. So it's actually stripping oxygen out of the water, which is why when you're doing compost teas, it's very easy to go anaerobic. And if you're using anaerobic water, you're feeding the bad guys. You're not feeding the good guys. You're not, you're not allowing the good biology to expand in your body. So that was a really good point on, on swirling. And I think uh, mm -hmm. Steiner, uh, Rudolf Steiner, uh, biodynamics did a lot of work and, and trying to understand water, mineralization. And he had these little things where it poured out of one thing into another, certain vortexes, you know, yeah. circles right if you're doing this and circles left if you're doing that. So, and there, you know, the guy, the guy was, the guy, you know, I can't say I don't appreciate what he did. He did, he did take some stuff a little too far religiously, I believe, but the groundwork that he did was amazing. And the guy, if you if you take the time to actually listen to some of his lectures that have been um, redone, um, the words are hard to understand. He talks about fairies and processes uh, in the soil. What he didn't know was that was the fungi, that was the biology. We just didn't have the understanding back then about these forces. But you know, again, I I, I think that he brought forth uh, a bunch of really good information. Uh, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of people disrespect um, because of some of the words he used, because he just didn't have the right words at that point in time. We didn't have the science behind it. But dissolved oxygen in your water, huge, really huge. Yeah. Tom Tomorrow, have you heard of there's some like belief systems where the, the little vortex kind of like what you're talking about, uh, whether it's for you to drink um, for your own personal health or to do that for your uh, plants is that water going through tubes or however that water is getting to you is also full of the memories of, I guess this is getting more metaphysical, but it is um, full of like kind of the memories of what had been going on. So some people believe, you know, if you're, they're going to drink that water, they kind of like let it rest for a back, probably a lack of a better word from my understanding of it. Um, I did just kind of learn more about this last night, but you just like let it rest there where it seems like um, I know a lot of the older heads here in Colorado would talk about they love using the vortex brewers that they built with like old uh, five gallon water uh, water jugs that you can get at Walmart kind of thing. So it just mm -hmm. spin. Um, do you feel like that is w worth it an investment or probably buying a better one if you're really, you know, truly a com like a commercial farmer kind of thing? Is it worth moving that water because there is memory in that water? And I, I cite for some of the like scientific more stuff. I believe his name is Dr. Emoto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fantastic. Can we talk more about that? Because I know that some people are going to shit on this hardcore yeah. and other people are going to love it. So no, uh, I mean, this is how it is. All yeah, Dr. Dr. Emoto did a lot of great work. I really studied a lot of his stuff for a while. And so even when we would go and fill up at these springs, the glass containers, the thing I did not mention is on the outside with the Sharpie, I would have Reiki symbols or love, you know, backwards going into this. And this is a thing I still do with um, almost everything I do is I'll put Reiki infused into it because yes, water definitely does hold memory. It holds, it absorbs. It's like this crystalline structure. You know, if we're going to get into energy, it's water, <laughs> it's powerful. And so he actually did these studies where he would put symbols and then crystallize it and show you the like the crystalline structure of when you say I hate you or, and all these like, you know, awful words compared to I love you. You are beautiful, perfect, you know, like all these just beautiful things where you would talk, talk to the water and have like all these different crystalline structures that he got to take pictures of. So if you ever able to look at his work, please do, because it's it's beautifully amazing. It makes you go, whoa. Um, and so he was really big into really introducing that and showing like the science, like there's science behind it. Um, and so 
I was a big proponent into compost teas. This this year, actually, I got away from my own compost teas. Um, I love doing the brewers. It was just, I think, that whole spiraling of the water um, for me and brewing it. And it's kind of like this magic you get to make happen. You know, it's like a little alchemy. But it's it's a lot of work because you have to make sure it doesn't go anaerobic. And if your temperatures change, you have to be on that or you're going to lose a batch. And so for me, I went to um, just doing the microbial solutions this year and the lab cultures and making my teas. But before I do, as I'm mixing all my, you know, teas and mixtures, a lot of my JLFs, Jadam liquid fertilizers, I'll do in there and my JMS I'm putting it into a barrel and what I do is I do the spiral. I do a hundred waves each time and I make sure because I'm thinking about that and I know that's how like life starts. Like that is the cosmic flow of like life is just this spiral energy. And so if I'm doing that, I'm activating some things. And then biodynamics, they talk about that a lot of doing it a hundred, a um, hundred times each way for activating the energy in that vortex. And so that is what I'm doing right before I feed my plants. And then I'm also, because I know it holds energy and stuff, I'm putting Reiki symbols into it and I'm giving a little energy depending on how much time I have. And so I'm very much of a believer in that and to speaking to your water and to, you know, writing beautiful symbols, beautiful things, because then you're intaking that into you. And I feel like that is another way when we're thinking about energy and how like we are these really powerful creators of what we think we can create. So if I feel like if we do have some water from Babylon, that's like, you know, not really good. And that's all you have. The thing I will do is I will bless it. I will pray over it. And I feel like it kind of just neutralizes things and it like shifts the vibration of it. So that's kind of like my last resort. But I usually, when I'm in Babylon, I have a little filter that does this whole spiral thing and neutralizes the toxins and, I'm kind of big when I travel. I travel around, I love travel around the world and I always have my, my water devices with me to make sure I have good water and clean water, but yeah. And I love the, the crystals. Um, mm -hmm. That's a really big thing. Crystals have memory. Um, yes. Then this is getting into woo woo. There's, there is some signs indicating that this is true. Um, we now know we can store data and information in, in different crystalline structures. So that means that there is information stored in there, even if we can't pull it out and directly access the way we think we should be able to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a lot of companies out there that actually put crystals in the glass bottles. I don't know if you've seen it. Pauline has one of them. And mm -hmm. you can get different types of crystals based on your need, whether it's a smoky quartz or an amethyst or whatever, um, and store your water in that. So it's, it's helping to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is a deep uh, uh, it, it helps to, to give that that structure. I, I shouldn't probably use that word because that word has been misused a lot in, in water conversations, mm -hmm. you know, about yeah. structured, about whether it's, you know, EC water, is it is it easy water, is it, you know. So there's, again, I'm just using these words lightly, but there's definitely something to having, you know, waters, uh, crystals in your water and in your soil, for sure. Yeah, we did that. We did that whole thing on on meridian lines and everything else. And yeah, people, people in the chat got us got a little crazy on us. But you know, there, it, it goes to show you there is stuff that we don't understand yet. And to be honest with you, it's kind of arrogant for you to think that you already know everything when science is showing us shit that so quickly right now it's not funny that we the more we know the more we realize we don't know shit right so you know to well, say oh there's you know there's no life in, in in a crystal or there's no memory i think is again kind of a um, small spirited arrogant point of view um there's there's so much that we don't get yet and and water is a big one water is a big one i mean it is the, there's a guy uh, i read his paper uh, his last name is bali b-a-l-i i'll have to try mm. to take it out but it was one of the most complex papers I've ever read in my life. And this guy, he eventually gets a little theoretical um, outside the box. But you could kind of see how he could go there based on the science and the work that has been done and the work that he continued or furthered on down the path. But, uh, Peter, I'll, I'll try to dig that up. Um, so bear with me here while I uh, chase my phone. <laughs> Well, tomorrow, I mean, yeah. like that documentary last night, I mean, it's it's basically stating, you know, you're 72% water, um, you know, 
if I'm sitting here and I'm drinking tap water, this is, I guess, another um, little rabbit hole, I guess. Um, so if I'm drinking tap water, I'm getting a, a bunch of chloramine, uh, chlorine, and then, of course, fluoride. Yeah. Um, and, you know, then if you're getting more into, I guess, certain belief Sick. systems, um, why is there fluoride in there? Have you ever seen what that does to a street? That kind of thing. And then there's a lot of people that believe that it calcifies the third eye. Um, are you able to speak on that a little bit for us? Um, I can go down my rabbit hole a little bit. I would definitely be considered one of those that can go there. Um, but for me, I feel like there's a lot of dumbing us down. I think we are these really powerful creators, these really powerful fucking beings. And I feel like we all have superpowers. You know, we all have our own because we all have our own and unique abilities. And so I think a lot of times that part of us gets suppressed and fluoride and chlorine definitely it calcifies. It also numbs you. They put they give fluoride to prisoners um, to kind of make them more numb um, in prison and jail. And so that's definitely a wide use thing. And of course, we know that that was used and then concentration camps. You know, there's these poisons that they're putting. Why would they do that? Why is there chemtrails? Why is there all this stuff happening in this world? For me, I, I thought a lot about it is like because I can't wrap my brain around that because for me, all I want to do is help, you know, and so how can we help? What would be the evilness behind that? What would be that? And I feel like there is something about control, you know, like wanting to control the mass kind of people and how you do that. You dumb them down, you know, and if that doesn't work, you completely berate them with distractions because if I'm not watching a show, what am I doing? I'm reading a book. If I or I'm outside meditating or I'm kind of creating, I'm writing. I've thought that about my own self. I'm like, how many times I get distracted and I'm not working on my own, like, you know, abilities or, you know, my own like passions because I'm like, oh, I'm just going to chill out and watch the show, you know, or something along those lines. And it's like we're berated constantly with that. And then, of course, there's the food. Why is our food poison? Like, why? It's because our food also activates us. If like we look at it, we are all energy. Everything is energy. So if that food is of a lower vibration and you're putting it into you, you're going to be at this lower vibration. But um, like, let's say you're eating this super healthy raw foods. And this is what I felt when I was, I loved the raw food diet when I was on it for a while because I felt so alive. I just like felt like I vibrated at this higher level. And as soon as I would eat something denser, I would feel the shift immediately. I'd feel more grounded, but I would definitely, it started making me understand how you can eventually become this like breatharian, maybe the evolution because of being able to absorb from sunlight, being able to absorb directly from clean water, fresh air, sun, you know, that really pure sunlight and, um, so, and I think that when I have been in my most purest state, I don't need my glasses. And that's what trips me out is like, I've been in rainbow gatherings where I just stopped using my glasses because I was being taken in the most purest. A lot of times I was fasting and my eyesight completely cleared up. And um, what I see is I see about a foot in front of me and everything else is blurry. But when I'm in my most purest state and I'm like, really, I feel like in tune with nature, I'm barefoot outside. And uh, I'm washing myself in the creeks. I've got all those, you know, microbes all over me. Then I can see and I feel so fucking good. And that is like the best I've ever felt. And I think that when you go into Babylon, what we call Babylon or whatever, it's like it's all about bombarding ourselves with toxins and poisons and distractions to really, for me, I think it's like numbing us down so we don't know our potential. So, yeah, that's my little I love that. <laughs> um, just so people understand, yes, fl fluoride is a rat poison, right? And and it was given to us under the guise that it was going to prevent cavities. Mm -hmm. There was no proof or studies done to the, that showed that this introduction into our water was helping us. And she's right. They, were, they, they used fluoride to get control of people um in in the prison camps to calm them down so that they wouldn't you know be so fighting and aggravating and you know causing problems so it's it's called you know poisoning literally to a point where now this person is controllable now as far as chloramine is concerned chloramine is chlorine and uh ammonia mixed together and the craziest part about it is is that I think it's close to 85% of all of our water treatment facilities are over treating. And the way they, they measure 
that they have enough chlorine, chloramine in the system is that once um, they start seeing excess ammonia or excess chlorine, now they know they've bonded to every single water molecule there. But what they're not talking about is what is the strength of that bond and how bad is that for the human body? I mean, the reason they brought chloramine in was because chlorine so easily gassed off. You know, we when I was younger, when we had heavily chloro, uh, chlorine water, all we did was stir it and the gas came off. You could smell it like crazy. But then once you got done stirring it, you couldn't smell it anymore. Then you knew it was time to go, go ahead and drink it. Um, so that's why they came up with a chloramine mo uh, molecule so that it wasn't as easily broken. Wow. And the craziest thing about this is, is that when you introduce organic matter to chloramine, it breaks into what's called a secondary disinfected byproduct. Google that shit. It's huh. horrifying. absolutely horrifying what it's doing for our health. And in a lot of these third world countries where they're actually storing the water in a reservoir, so there's going to be a lot of tannin. There's going to be a lot of organic matter floating around in the, in the you know, humus or humate or humic uh, acid, whatever you want to call it. It's already in the water. So then they pump in this chloramine. By the time that pipe gets down to the end of that run, the people drinking that are getting whacked with these secondary disinfectant byproducts and their health is collapsing. Mm -hmm. Now they're like, oh, well, how do we fix this? And it's like, you got to get rid of this shit. You can't fix it because Mother Nature is going to do what Mother Nature does. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've got we've got a lot of issues with with you know Babylon water, and it's global. It's not just here in the U.S. It's, as a matter of fact, it's way worse in these developing countries. So yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go so dark and deep, but you know, just so people understand that even if you take water and you add you know humic acid what you're doing is you are getting some of these secondary byproducts. Yes, you're breaking the molecule apart so that the chlorine can gas off and the ammonia can be absorbed by the biology, but you're still making these secondary metabolites that, that are detrimental to human health and, and all, mm -hmm. all that. Is 24 hours, I always felt like that was the metric. Is that a solid metric there uh, for chlorine to, to gas off if you bubble it? Um, actually, no, chlorine, just straight chlorine, um, you can gas off in a matter of minutes. Uh, they say chloramine can get gassed off in 24 hours. That's bro science. It doesn't gas off. I've not, taken yeah, I had taken water and bubbled it for like two weeks to try to get rid of that shit. Um, in, in my shop in Bantam, um, I'm at the end of one of these runs. And so all the shit collects right at the end. So our level of, of chlor chloramine is just horrific. And so I actually had to bring in water. I was actually pumping wow. out of the river or bringing from a well uh, to mix my biologicals because I couldn't use the town water. And so, no, the only way to break the chloramine bond is to use a humic acid or humic substance. Wow. Um, the so only way to do charcoal it. filters and all that. And the yeah, charcoal water. helps, but a lot of it still gets through. Um, and you in the charcoal is all about surface time. So the water can't just run through there. Like a lot of people put those little charcoal filters on their hoses. It's going to help, but it's all about the time, the contact time of the water with the uh, activated carbon. That's the key to the whole thing. So now you, need, you know, 20 of these filters in a row to, to, so that they, the water has enough to contact time with the activated carbon to strip all of that. So then, then it gets cost prohibitive. So yeah, it's it. Water's a friggin' huge issue, man. And I, I, I just texted the boys to see if I can get that paper because I scrolled back till friggin' October of last year and I couldn't find it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, found. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say water is like an afterthought for a lot of a lot of people in their life as well as farmers. Um, mm -hmm. I think they're just. They, they might not realize just those small little things like I was mentioning, you know, that really add up. Um, and I appreciate you guys kind of going there with me and talking more of uh, maybe some of the fringe things I feel like for some of those science driven uh, cannabis farmers. Um, but again, like when you mentioned the ley lines and stuff like that, when people are making fun of that, that doesn't really make sense to me because we had mentioned that all of those um, 
uh, mansions and that kind of stuff, all, especially those Scottish yards and that kind of stuff, those are all built on those ley lines. So there's got to be something to energy if the ultra, ultra elite are taking the time to build uh, compounds, basically uh, castles. Um, on those ley lines. And then there's uh, the Rosalind Chapel. I don't know if you've, you know, I don't know how deep we could go into this kind of stuff, but <laughs> the Rosalind Chapel's on that kind of stuff. And water is very important. So I just, I don't that's know. I just, cool. I feel like later in life, I, I just want more and more people to understand that I think water, if you're drinking tap water every day, uh, you might need to rethink that or start to study this shit. You know, don't take anything we're saying. Just go, go research this stuff for yourself and see where those ley lines exist and why why are there castles built on that and why was water so important especially back in the day um and farmers and ranchers those were the real i feel like um people of importance you know i, I definitely feel like they were especially the ranchers and that kind of stuff were just you know i have a there's a guy that right behind me in the back of my yard here he's been trying to farm it seems like for like 10 years um and all i ever see him successfully grow is corn and I would imagine that's because it's subsidized by the government, mm. you know, but he flies the plane over, sprays the pesticides. I mean, <sighs> yeah. it's huge. It goes through our, whole, you know, behind our entire uh, little neighborhood here. Uh, but I don't think that guy, he can't be really turning a profit. And I know that the water out here can't be that great because uh, they frack. Mm. Oh, God. Fracking is yeah, probably the worst possible thing we could do. Because it's collapsing aquifers, it's polluting those mineral fractures where all of that beautiful water mineralization is happening. And yeah, that's <laughs> fracking. Don't get me started on that one. Let's uh, change yeah. the subject, please. <laughs> yeah, it's rough. It's rough. Um, yeah, just like you were saying, the ley lines, not only as like, you know, modern day humans, we also have our ancient civilizations that were built on that. You know, we have all of the, you know, Stonehenge and things that are even more ancient and any of the temples, they're built close to usually really good water and ley lines. And I kind of thought that's interesting. Like when we travel around the world, that's like my favorite thing to do is go to those kind of sacred spots. And it's, it's fascinating to me because there is an accumulation of energy and it's just kind of like, what were people doing here? Why would they create something so moment, you know, momentous if there wasn't something to this, you know, there's, yeah. And the more you tune in, the more you tapped into yourself and like you're the earth and walk barefoot and drink clean water and eat clean food, the more you understand that what we're saying is not like crazy nonsense. Um, yeah, but it also can be dangerous because it's like taking that red pill, man. <laughs> you yeah. Can't go back. Sorry, can't go back. Can't go back. Well, I feel like now's the time to take that pill finally because yeah. what, when else? I mean, if you if you don't believe that some shit is probably going to happen in our world in the next few years, I don't think you're really paying attention. Um, our, there's a lot of things that our country is doing right now that's pissing off a lot of our allies and so i feel like if you're not focused at least on trying to educate yourself uh, and and grow for experience just a little um you know a little out, outdoor garden or if your hoa allows it i would uh shout out to um uh, genome genome alchemy you know when i go over to his house he's a seed breeder tomorrow uh, here in denver kind of a mm -hmm. in my opinion like a little local celebrity uh, so shout out to him, but he lives and breathes it, man. He's able to live in a place where the front of his house looks like, uh, like a farmer's market to me in the back, uh, you know, he just continues into the backyard and he has this like, kind of like UA, uh, oasis in the middle of like an urban area. Uh, so I would, that, I feel like if you can kind of get your stuff or, or start thinking that way, at least because, um, I'll be, I'll be honest with you guys. I, I'm kind of nervous with, um, some of the stuff that's happening and if you, if you're not able to uh, have clean water and take care of your family uh, things are things might change it's true it's true i also feel like people that are in like those neighborhoods like you're saying you're in and like this the, that man that's doing that farm right there those are freaking warriors that's the warrior work you know for me i got i jumped out and i'm able to kind of do what i'm doing from a different perspective, but like it's warrior work, you know, you're going to have to learn how to bake, you know, like there's a, I was just looking up, there's the pristine hydra.com is one of that one that does the really cleaning out, but has like a 10 step filter with restructuring or re, you know, invigorating your water. There's the Berkey filters, you know, finding how you can re 
clean your water and make it alive again and then grow as many things as possible. I feel like that's another part of us is like, what I always try to think about is like when the world is like so much chaos and there's so much shit going on and there's so much bad shit happening. I'm like, how the hell can I help? How, what can I do? And then I realized like, this is what we could all do is like fulfill our purpose here. Like what is our human potential? What is my purpose? If I'm in tune with my purpose, then I'm going to be of that highest service to humanity. And I feel like one of those ways of getting to that purpose and getting back to myself is touching the earth, growing things, getting more in tune with her because we are so interconnected and getting your health, you're getting that clean water, getting that pure food because then you like your brain is unfogged and then you're like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, you know? And then like following that path by following like where you feel good, what makes you feel good? And that's what we do because that's where our purpose lies, you know? And so I feel like the people that are in neighborhoods, if you can do that and like really show, have that farmer's market, have that forest looking gardens, have that food, not lawns, you know, it's definitely part of that movement where we created lot food instead of lawns for in some neighborhoods, that was fun. But that's huge. It just gets people like, oh, I could do that. That's beautiful. Oh, that's cool. What are you doing? You know, it, it triggers that and that awareness starts happening, you know, where it's just that escalating, I feel like, our evolution. So warrior work for people inside Babylon really doing it. Yeah, and that's kind of what we're doing here is, mm -hmm. is helping people understand, of, you know, some of the tricks and techniques that, that do help you. And, you know, I love what you brought up about grounding. You know, Brian and I have talked about that. You know, I don't care if you're in the middle of the city. You can go to the beach, collect some sand, put it put it in a box or a pan, fill it with a little bit of water, and just put your feet in there and rest, mm -hmm. and you will feel the difference. You know, grounding is real. And, and you know, if you don't want to walk around in the city with bare feet to get cut by all the glass shards, this is a way to do it. You know, and I don't care if you're on the 30th floor of the building, you still connect to the concrete and the iron that are holding you up. Mm -hmm. uh, I forget what those uh, those rooms are that are all steel bars around that are grounded. Um, Prison. Well, no, there's, <laughs> there's ones that they use to protect you against certain uh, magnetic waves. Mm. Um, anyway, I won't go there. That's another deep rabbit hole. <laughs> That's cool. I don't know hey, about one, that. One last little uh, rabbit hole for the audience. I feel like is if we could talk uh, tomorrow and Leighton about leaf litter. Um, I don't think people really understand, myself included. When I was first getting into this, this guy gave me so much leaf litter, and I just didn't appreciate what he gave me. I didn't understand what it was. Uh, so that was something I hope that we could kind of talk on. Uh, just the importance of kind of organic matter, decomposing, breaking down, chop and drop, all of those things uh, in addition with um, um, adding wood, basically. There it is. Faraday cage. Thank you, Shanti. Much appreciated. You guys look into that. It's pretty crazy shit. Um, I, think, I think the big thing with leaf litter is that you are getting the endophytic biology so both fungal and bacteria are stored in those leaves and when that leaf lands on the ground those endophytes become saprobes so they actually start breaking down that organic matter um, and if that leaf falls into a stream it could be an aquatic um, saprobe and so that was why we brought um dr was it david white no uh, come on layton do you remember the show we did on the endophytes James White. James wife. Oh, James White. Yes, Dr. James White. Correct. He he's an amazing guy. He's just so easy to talk to. He's not full of himself. Um, and he will go into theory with you, which is a pleasure because a lot of scientists are afraid to, to step outside of the box, so to say. Um, but he'll 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 chop it up and explain it to you on a level that, that's easy to understand. And that's that's really the key to that leaf litter and, and the chopping and dropping. That What you're doing is you're biomimicking nature's own system. And the more often we can do that, the better off we are going to be as far as creating a healthy environment for our plants, um, as well as providing them all of the biological constituents that they need to continue their whole cycle. Remember, it's a big, big loop. It's not just a, you know, the seasons. It's years of, of evolution. The soil is always moving in a new direction. The weeds, they're not weeds, they're indicator plants. 
they're pulling some kind of nutrient out of the soil to prepare that soil for the next successionary plant system to come and play. So yeah, leaf litter is, is probably one of the most valuable um, tools that, that we have. And yet everybody puts it in bags and freaking throws them in landfills. It's the insanity of humanity. I mean, you've heard me talk about this GOM project. So GOM is ground up organic matter and it's coming in in millions of tons into um, all of these recycling centers and landfills. And in California, they've basically said by December 31st, 2022, green waste and food waste will no longer be allowed to be diverted to landfills. Mm -hmm. What are they gonna do with 20 million tons, which is equivalent to two and a half to three and a half yards, 60 million yards per wow. year. Right. So they brought me in to try to figure out how to arrest it, how to mineralize it and how to biologically activate it so that it at least has some value. Because right now they're only processing about two and a half to three and a half million yeah. yards, which is think about that million yards a year. And 80 percent of it is getting dumped on agricultural fields as a herbicide <laughs> to kill, kill mm -hmm. off the fucking weeds um, and then being tilled in as a carbon source, which it's scary as it sounds it's actually better than putting in a fucking landfill right um but if if it didn't kill plants then they could actually sell it <laughs> imagine that right and by default we'd be fucking cleaning up the surface of the earth by building soil everywhere in babylon everywhere all the parks all the you know the little home gardeners um all the sports fields like th there's another mandate that they've got to start getting away from pesticides so a lot of the school systems are looking for quality compost to use as a top dressing to help build the soil, help bring back the indigenous pests or not the pests, the predators. Um, and they've shown really good success, but the problem is no one's making good compost. Mm -hmm. It's this municipal waste compost that's gone. That's basically gassing off ammonia. Um, so you're losing your nitrogen sources. You're losing all of that beneficial fertilizers that could be, you know, helping the biology grow, helping the plant grow. And instead it's just gassing off, which nobody talks about that. Methane and friggin' ammonia, so much worse than CO2, like off the scale, thousands of times worse. And yet we've got piles of these gum in every municipal uh, waste facility that all you smell is ammonia when you walk up and, and, and breathe it or touch it. So, you know, CO2, that's just a, that's a joke. We really need to be looking at these other greenhouse gases that are way, way more detrimental to the environment. But yeah, solving problems, war, warrior work. I, I love it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's really what it's all about is, is building your soul, making yourself feel better, connecting with earth. Yeah, that red pill's a jagged one to fucking swallow. But, you know, it's, it's good for your soul it'll make you a better person and, and hopefully you'll you'll infect others to start thinking this way because if we don't get our shit together as a species mm -hmm. we're just fucking skipping blindly into oblivion at this point and so wake up people drop that fucking red pill and get to work <laughs> tomorrow what are your thoughts on leaf litter mm. i'm definitely not as scientifically termed but I think what I feel with it is, it, I don't fucking love it. <laughs> like there's the mycelium, you know, that you're able to utilize to, um, that's right there. Like I use the, my, the leaf litter that's right beside the trees, beside my garden. And so I know that I'm able to take the microbial life that's right there and introduce it more into the garden, into the same environment. And I love that so much more than when I used to buy, you know, microbials for $800 a fucking bucket. And those were from the sea and they didn't even grow in my environment, you know. And so to me, I, I just love this able to go and collect and to see the mycelium working. Because, I mean, that is breaking all that leaf down into nutrients. So we know if we're taking that and putting that into our hugels around our plants or giving like those microbes in there for teas, then they're going to work because they're in their same environment and they're going to start breaking down that wood and making those nutrients available. And another reason that I 
did the hugels and I wanted to have long rows was because I knew the mycelium network could go completely throughout that without having individual little beds, you know? And that was really important because that way, you know that if like this plant needs nutrient, it's way over here, it can go real on that like length real fast and get it back to it. And so adding, I feel like those my, that mycelium from that leaf litter is really important. And um, that's a huge part of like my growing. And so, and also I want to talk about too, like when you take, give back. And so what I do is I'll have some compost left if I do an extract tea, or if I have some of that leaf litter left, that leaf mold left from after doing a Jadon microbial solution, I'll go put some of that back exactly where I found it and I'll take from another place. And then later I'll go and usually what I have put back has grown tenfold because it's like all up in there and it's more wet. And so I think it's a really good thing to talk about is to, to also when you're out in nature and you're taking from nature because that is its food and especially on a place like mine, where there's not very much of it, where there's more rock and desert environment. I always make sure that I give just as much back, if not more. And um, but yeah, I think that's a huge, it's a huge element to growing. It changed my whole way I did everything once I started understanding mycelium. Yeah, I love the yeah. part of giving back. Like I tell people, if you're going to wildcraft leaf litter or you know sand, silt, or clay out of nature. Bring a bucket of something in with you, something that you did, and then take the bucket. But never leave scars. Never collect the leaf litter yeah. and don't put something back and leave an open wound in nature because that's that's going to bring you some bad karma at the very little least. Um, Peter, I, I just forwarded you that paper on Ball. Um, put it up for people if they want to uh, check it out. It's, it's a really, really deep rabbit hole into water. And what is it? Um, it's a bad yeah, idea. I think spending the time to educate yourself on water, whether if it's for your personal health or for your farm, uh, is time well spent. Definitely. That's like the first thing when I work with people, um, I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultations. And so when someone comes to me, one of the first thing, depending on like what cancer is going on or if there's Lyme or, you know, just whatever's going on, I'm like, what is your food? What is your water source? You know, how are you feeling? What is your emotions like every day? You know, all these things really matter into health. But our water source is like we've been talking about. It's so important. You can't cleanse yourself. You cannot detox yourself if you're that that carrier for those nutrients and those herbs is filled with toxins. So it doesn't work. So you have to have some kind of clean water and find that source. Findaspring.com is a really good resource. I believe it's still up. And it's another one that you can search out your local springs in your area that you can go and fill up with. And, um, but other than that, like I said, the Berkey is pretty good. But the, the Pristine Hydro, I think is what it's called, is one of the new ones I've seen. But just, you know, do your research. Find some really good ways to get those contaminants out and to re-energize, re in that water. And then the, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. that's the paper. Hell yeah. It's crazy, crazy deep. Oh, wow. And so where cool. would they find that, Leighton? Is that uh, deep? Peter, in the Peter put the link. I would say just take a picture, take a take your phone and grab a screenshot of that. Um, I know it's a pain in the ass, but um, I don't know other any other way to give a quick link out on this platform. You know, I think I think Peter can put the link in the comments. Mm -hmm. yeah, he did. And he just, just popped it up. Click on the link in the comments yeah. or use your Google abilities and type in water as an active constituent in cell biology. <laughs> there you go. That's why you got an Emmy, Peter. That's <laughs> my common sense. <laughs> so, uh, Tamara, I know uh, one of the other nuggets I learned, uh, well, I guess you're kind of like went deeper on is you know, some of those people that are spending a lot of money on biologicals uh, and then going out of their way, I feel like maybe trying to uh, take care of their plants. Maybe sometimes we do a little too much uh, and then going out of their way to make those essential oils. Uh, so I was wondering if we could kind of maybe talk about that topic and then I'm sure the audience has some questions for you. What, what are you about essential oils, though? Uh, how it kills the, the biologicals. Oh, yes, yes. And so... Uh, I love essential oils. Like I said, I use them a lot in our products and stuff, but they are extremely powerful. They are very concentrated, like, you know, particles and those compounds of those plants and in tiny drops. 
And so any of that, any essential oil is antiviral, antimicrobial, like anti everything, antifungal. And so if you're putting that directly onto your plants, you're killing your biology that you have just cultivated, your good and your bad. You might be killing the bad, but you're also killing the good, um, which, you know, if you do afterwards, I would come, I mean, let's say you, that's what you have. If you have that on hand, okay, use that. And then afterwards, do a lab or a JMS to draw a microbial solution and spray that plant with it again. Re, re like grow your microbials. But I would recommend not using that. And like the best like pesticide and way I've found is the Jadam herbal solution, which is taking those same exact plants. Like I, my favorites are right now are rosemary and mint. They smell so good. And you just take those herbs and I'll use like two pounds per gallon of water. And then I'll boil that for five hours and then you strain it. And um, you put those in containers, you know, you wanna make sure it's like you, you have sanitized containers so that way you can store it. Um, and then you use that to like a 30 to one with your water and put a little biological soap in there. And that has been the best thing I have seen for taking out any pests, yes. And like, this is another one I started doing for, I had thrips this year, you know, every year you have some kind of bug and this year was just thrips, it's no big deal. And so I, I kept it maintained um once a week and then i started doing once every two weeks with the jadam herbal solution and this year i started playing with a bunch of others like i have bay laurel and juniper at my house and of course those are smelly plants you, you that's the way you can kind of tell what one of the herbs are that you can use is if it's like super smelly and so i combined those and it took out everything including the aphids on my trap plants because <laughs> i wanted to see you know if this is going to work and that's another thing kind of fun about your trap plants is you're able to see if something that you're going to use is going to work because it'll kill those bugs that are there. But I like using the full plants instead of any time of essential oils and that it keeps your microbial life and balance and it's not as hard. It's not as harsh. As it is, so. how, how are you boiling it for five hours without boiling off all the water? Um, okay, so I boil it, I put it on high to boil, and then afterwards, it gets to the high and everything's boiling, I'll put it to like, like maybe a medium to low, um, and just kind of let it simmer boil. And yeah, it works. And you have a lid on, you yeah, know. Yeah, I was gonna say, a lid on it, okay. And so another way too is I really like using it in my um, crock pots. The crock pots are an easy way to do it, especially like the bay laurel is so strong that I have to do it outside in a crock pot. It just becomes crazy potent <laughs> so much that I actually use a mask and gloves when I'm handling it. And so that's one that I've actually started mixing with others like the juniper or the mint or rosemary just because it's so strong. But a crock pot is a really easy way to do that. You turn it on high and then you just put it on medium. Um, but if you just have a pot and you have your stove, you can easily, you know, just do it with the two pounds per gallon. And I put all the herbs in a straining bag and then put that in a big old rock on top. So it's all underneath the water and a lid on top. And you just let that go. You know, I loved what you said about smelling the plants, right? So if the plant smells, it's called a vol volatile organic compound yeah. or a perfume. It's just like the canvas plant. It's giving that off as a defense. So obviously it can be used in other manners to defend plants that are being um, attacked. So I love mm -hmm. the way you put that. That was that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. There's a little yeah. gold nugget for the audience. You can use anything, mm -hmm. it smells. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it smells good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for some of those farmers that um, are combat russet mites is there um something that you feel like is tried and true on the commercial level uh, to combat that on a, with a more like natural farming approach i would try some of the more stronger ones like um i've had i'm trying to think when i had the mite the mite issue the Jordan, the um jerusalem artichoke is really good and you take that full plant and you want it when the best time to get it is when it is in the fall when you have that full plant and i like having a little bit of the bud of the flower and the root and you take that and you boil it down but any of your peppers are going to knock those out like your ghost peppers or cayenne is really good um and i believe the bay laurel the bay laurel is so freaking strong um it'll definitely kill them and what you would just do is you would create the protocol because you know that they you you have to learn the life cycle of your bug 
And then, you know, and what's nice about the Jadam Herbal Solution is that you can actually do that up to three times a day and it's not going to like burn your plant. And so you can do that, especially that first day you see them. And then you can do it like once the next day and kind of do that up to like your 10 days, you know, whatever your protocol that you decide is and it'll knock them out. Um, I've definitely had great results. Like of all the stuff I've done, that has been like one of the best for knocking out bugs. And I usually get bugs only when I wasn't paying attention, you know, or like something in the greenhouse during the winter when, you know, it's off balance. And so, and then like stuff gets really big and I've definitely found, you know, some bugs at the top and that's when I'll bring in the um, herbal solutions. But a lot of times I just do my whole balance of the gardens and I don't really have too many bug issues. But I think the um, Jerusalem artichoke, the ghost pepper, the cayenne, and the bay laurels would really be great for the red for the um, russet mites. Yeah. And but also, but making yeah. sure you put that soap in there too, because you can have that solution and it's good, but that soap really coats it. And it's like the, what we do in the Jadam stuff is use the Jadam wetting agent, where you make your own soap with oil, and you can actually infuse the herb into the oil first. And you make this like very um, slippery kind of soap to be able to spray on. And so that's when the magic happens is when you have that soap and that herbal solution. Yeah, it basically sticks. It's why they use soap and napalm. So it sticks. Mm. Mm -hmm. Really good advice. Gold nugget. <laughs> yeah, you're definitely... Um... A world of knowledge. No wonder you and Joey uh, chop it up on a, a variety of things, I'm sure. Yeah. Is he still sitting there by you? No, he went. Oh. I think he's doing hash right now. We uh, just did a, I showed him how to do hash the other day, and so uh, he's yeah. all at it right now. He's fucking loving it. So, uh, yeah, I think he's down doing a run right now. <laughs> yeah, it'd be sure. fun to be sitting around your dinner table at night, right, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're total far nerds. Like uh, behind me is like books, like stacked up from both of us. I oh, can't see them, and like both of our stacks of books that we're like continuously reading. And that's all we talk about is all this stuff. You know, this is like our life, and I always think about what's the next. And that's why I'm excited to do the demonstration gardens at our place because a lot of these fun permaculture techniques that we've been learning about. I, I'm going to be able to demonstrate and I really want to be able to show that and it's show it really working to inspire and encourage other people to do the same, especially out here in California where our water, you know, we've, we've had hardly any rain this year and I want to create my land to be water rich. And so I've taken, I really love the guy in Africa. I forgot the, the water farmer's name. Guy. The water I fucking water. love him. And yeah, so amazing. I want to go there at some point. And so, but that really inspired me when I heard that years ago. And so I love going out in the rains and kind of looking where my water's going. So we're putting in a lot of swells this year and um, going to have some fun playing with all that and building kugels around it and seeing what we can create in this like desert environment that I've got. So it's fun. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think if you <clears throat> search um, water harvesting in Africa, the guy will mm -hmm. come. He's done a couple really cool videos, and some talks, and I, I talk about this a lot and how everybody should do it. I don't care how much rain you're getting, if you're slowing it, you're preventing erod or erosion, and you're storing it in your soil, you're, you're going to have better luck with whatever you're growing. Mm -hmm. So, great a great resource for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> so i noticed that you're using biochar you know some people kind of poo poo that i guess maybe because you know a lot of people use so much of it um but do you mind like kind of explaining why you personally use it um, for more microbials. I mean, that's really it. And I've got so much wood around me. It's another great way to utilize all the wood I have. And um, we put a lot of like intention into ours. If you saw our biochar pit, um, we kind of like we did a little like ritual and words and kind of have like a little prayer around it as we're doing it. And then we soak all of that biochar that we make into one of the fermented teas. And then that's all the little microbes have like, you know, they have little homes and stuff to go into and that little, that biochar that's super porous and then putting that into the garden. 
and I don't do it very often. We might do it once a year, you know, and it's just another, you know, tool in your toolbox. I think that's really great and can be beneficial, especially for places that, you know, you have a lot of wood and you have a lot of down trees and, you know, just needing more, more microbials if it's more desert landscape like mine. That's one reason we use it. And, uh, but yeah, for me, I, I like taking, I'm very eclectic with the way I farm and the way I do everything. And so I take from all kinds of subjects. I'm a biodynamic farmer. I do Jajam, k and I do a lot of different permaculture techniques. You name it. I like, I'll take a lot from Elaine Ingram. I take a lot from, you know, just different sources wherever I can learn. I'm a forever student. So biochar is awesome. I love it, you know, for yeah, my I'm own purposes. I really appreciate you, Tamara, saying that and naming a variety of different people. Because Leighton and I, I feel like sometimes some of these guys are pigeonholed and ladies are pigeonholed into their belief mm -hmm. system. And anytime we bring on somebody that doesn't resonate with their belief system, it's just bullshit to them. And that's the part I don't really understand is we're supposed to all be learning here. And I feel like you can learn from a variety of people. Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciate you saying that part of things because... I, I think if you're going to cultivate cannabis on a commercial level, you need the the whole gamut of, of a tool set to be able to combat a lot of those, especially when it pest issues at the commercial level, like you had mentioned, get maybe getting a little sloppy or, um, you know, having other things where you miss a pocket that all of a sudden now you got russet mites or Leighton and I have talked about too, when your team's out of whack and everybody's like friction and that kind of stuff. You know, the, the team's kind of just probably going through the motions. They're not paying attention. There's a bunch of issues through that. So I feel like uh, we were able to go a little more metaphysical today where uh, I hope that other people see and maybe, you know, research yourself on the ley lines and that kind of stuff. See see what people were doing way before the um, electronics, the Internet. I, I still feel like they understood energy on a whole nother level. I know I uh, for a while was studying this tribe. I think it was called the, the Dogon tribe. Mm -hmm. And for, for however they were able to do that, they knew about the star Sirius, um, you know, before anybody really, basically. So I, I encourage people that always kind of dismiss this stuff, maybe to research and, and look for yourselves on. It seems like the ancients knew way more. Uh, we, we make fun of them for a variety of things, but I feel like they they were definitely tapped in to something. Um, or like, have you ever heard that dude, Edgar Casey? <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, how do you explain that? Kind oh, of yeah. Stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'd love to just speak real quick on that, too, tomorrow. Thank you for bringing that up. And and that is a, a bone of contention with a lot of people that, you know, they're they're afraid to step outside the box. And, you know, you can take what you want from different people. You don't have mm -hmm. to take it all. You don't have to buy a hook, line and sinker. But every single type and method and technique has some true gold nuggets in it. It's just a matter of you understanding enough of it to be able to utilize those mm. things instead of poo-pooing it. And, and on the ancients, Brian, they discovered a device that is so complicated in its mechanics um, used to navigate stars. Uh, it's this little golden box that they found buried in the coral, coral off of, I believe it was Greece, um, that I occasionally see pop up in my feeds. But they, they're like, we, we, can't, we couldn't even make this today. Uh, mm -hmm. how intricate it was and and so it was there there was a lot of shit that got lost and remember the victor of the war always wiped out all of the technology and the and the knowledge of the of the past because again power is created by lack of knowledge i have power over you if you know nothing because you need me so that was that was the theory and then we've destroyed our relationship with plants and herbs that that tribes thousands and thousands of years ago were using on a daily basis so you know keep an open mind and, and tomorrow again thank you so much for bringing that up again you know hit that home to people you don't have to follow one leader there's there's, yeah. there's so much information out there well let's you shouldn't follow one leader you know mm -hmm. if you're this full line and sinker that's called a cult and you better get the hell out of that because i feel like some of these people that are farming <laughs> you guys the way you talk is borderline cultish. And I'll say that to you lovingly, I hope. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's learn from a variety of people. Let's not just be like, yo, this is the only way I farm. Okay. But that's your personal belief system. Uh, there's a lot of things out there for us to learn. And uh, tomorrow you're living proof of what it really takes to, to farm at, a, at an elite level. Um, and mm -hmm. the fact, like Clayton said, two of you are sitting there at the table. I can't imagine. 
uh, all the, uh, you know, the, the mistakes that are minimized between the two of you by just sitting there and chopping it up. Mm. And I love the camps you guys are doing, man. I just, it's, it's such a bummer. This COVID bullshit um, has affected our ability to travel and, and gather, you know, um, Joey's been working on those for, for what, two years now. And, and then it just COVID hit. Um, yeah. Funny. Cause I was yeah. going to do a microscope class and I know Chris Trump was coming up there. You know, it's an amazing resource. And I, I texted him the other day and I, I, t I asked him, I hope that, that that guy purchased it, um, that was thinking about buying that facility because it needs, it needs to be able to be opened back up again. It's just such a magical place. Yeah, hey, definitely. Real, <laughs> real quick to Joey. How cool is it to have a girl that smokes blunts and drinks chocolate milk? <laughs> <laughs> and has a badass knowledge. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'm talking about. I was sitting there with the blunt, drinking her chocolate milk. <laughs> that was my raw cacao, um, also sprouted um, seed milk, too, by the way. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it was. Yeah, I'm sure it wasn't like mess quick. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, this was great. Uh, Peter, if, if there's questions, um, you know, let's let's fire away. I think, um, you know, one of the main things that I, I just appreciate is that, you you know, you're coming on here and you're just telling it like it is. And I, I feel like a lot of those, especially some of the, even the guests, I've I personally have tried to, like, pull a little more out of them. And I don't feel like they want to go that way or sometimes even the metaphysical way. Just I, I understand it because this shit is forever. Right. What we just did is forever. And some people don't want to speak on those kind of things. But. Um, I feel like if you take the time to research there, that has to be a, a rabbit hole that you, you're either going to choose to go down or, or choose not to. Uh, but <laughs> I feel like there's a reason why the elite of the elite, uh, really understand energy. Um, and there's a whole weirdness to, uh, like, if you really want to get, I guess, if you want to see both sides, there's this dude named Alex Esther Crawley. And if you research that motherfucker, I assure you, it's going to be very eye opening to you. Um, a variety of different things in life. I mean, that's a rabbit hole in general. There's um, music that's generated um, to that gentleman and stuff like that. So uh, energy is real in my book uh, on both sides. Well, remember, everything is waves. Vibration, which is music. Light, which is vibration. Everything is vibration. The earth vibrates at a certain level. I think um, it's 3.18. Uh, I don't remember, to be honest with you. And we tune our guitars to 3.2 something, if I'm correct. I'm sure someone in the chat will remember. Um, and I think Peter's getting his butt handed to him by his wife because he ate the wrong pastrami sandwich. So that's why he isn't <laughs> That's why he isn't on. <laughs> well, hey, any man that has yeah, three kids. That, that, that is. was my brother that I already got yelled at. Uh, <laughs> evidently, I was supposed to know the brown paper bag that said pastrami on it. had. There were two of them, and one had all the delicious goodness on it, which is the one I wanted. And I grabbed the dry, plain one, which is uh, what she wanted. So... <laughs> Well, hopefully there'll be some peace under the roof when you get done. Yes. Mm -hmm. Won't be warfare. So anyway, um, were there any questions out there, audience, that you'd like to ask her? Now I'm rolling well, into I just had a quick, uh, I, I had from the very beginning queued up. Um, this and was hoping um. you could maybe just walk through the kind of elaborate on the permaculture principles. Cool. Yeah. All right. So we've got observe and um, and what is this one? Let me look at these. Observe and interact. That's just like observing your environment and like how everything like really interacts with each other. That's. I know that Joey can speak a lot more onto this, but I'm more lay in my terms and how I just like see things. So that's how I'm going to speak. So for me, like when I went to my property, I like sat and you need to like, it's really good to observe a place. If you have the ability to observe a place for a year without really building or doing your design, you have so much more to work with because you can see how your winds go. You can see where your sun is at. You can see how the rain comes down off your hillsides and 
where it pulls and it's really in seeing how your wildlife interacts with all that, seeing the small nuances that really create where you're living or where you're wanting to design and the catch in your store and energy. And that's by observing, you're able to see where you're able to collect those energy sources. Um, but then another really cool way is like even just your canopy of your plants, you're able to catch sunlight in different ways. Like my cannabis will catch it there this time. And then underneath I have some herbs that are maybe more sensitive to that. And so it's like you're able to catch it all the way down to the ground if you have these different layers and different levels of canopy and um, you're able to store it you know within and also the whole thing i feel like with water is being able to catch that water and store it so it's finding you know those different systems that's why i love permaculture it's all about these systems and obtain yield and that's you know let's it's obtaining your yield increasing that and like i feel like by really paying attention you're able to yield more than if you just go in and be like, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm just going to flatten this land. And, you know, I'm going to take these trees up. I'm going to get this much yield per, but Oh, if you really like slow down and you pay attention how nature works, you can be way more in harmonious with that and obtain your yields more and um, being able to have different yields because you're having different sources of income or different kind of plants and things available. Um, let me go back to that slide so I can see going through again. Um, Apply yeah. self-regulation. Yeah. Self and that's, that's the whole thing. It's like apply your self-regulation. Maybe instead of doing like an acre or five acres or like people out here in Lake County are trying to do 134 fucking acres of cannabis, you can apply self-regulation on yourself and go also like what kind of lifestyle do I want to have? What actually will meet my needs? What will meet like not just, you know, what would be harmonious with the earth? How can I be sustainable? and like accept that feedback, not only from other people, but also from your environment. Because if your environment saying this isn't working because every year something's fucking up, or you're getting pests in this one area, or you're getting rained out or, you know, something's happening, then accept that feedback that maybe that's not the right place to, um, you know, plant something or, you know, just kind of shift it a little bit. I think your environment gives you like some of the most immediate feedback that there is. Um, so what else we got? We got use valuable resource, renewable energy and resources. Yeah. So renewable energy and resources is like, what is renewable? What can be redone over and over and over again? And like, what are your resources that you have available? Because if you're buying stuff um, from that's being mined out of the earth, is that renewable? No, not over years and years or maybe millions of years or minerals coming out of the earth, you know. But if you're finding resources on your land to use or you're building your soil, your, your manures are a huge one. You know, bringing in animals into a farm really helps have renewable resources. And like for us, I also like the whole thing of um, that whole industrial harvesting I learned during that one um, place I lived in Texas where what was our renewable resources? Leaves. We collected so many thousands of leaves. And then we used the leaves that were in the black trash stick bags to put around some of the plants in the wintertime. And we had fresh greens. And um, then we were able to use the wood that would come in from the different the power company kind of putting those down like those aren't renewable, but there's like, it's being able to harvest what's around you and being able to reuse that over and over. And just like, I love the oyster shells we got. And for me, it's like really about reaching out what's local, you know, like, yes, definitely what's on our property, but what's, what's also local and how can you make a difference? And like, I think harvesting those leaves was way better than them going to the dump. You know, how can you make a better impact, you know, by, by even collecting that? I don't want to hurt anything. I want to like find ways that whatever I do, it helps, you know, it doesn't hinder. So that's kind of what I look at when I see that. Um, produce no waste. Yeah. <laughs> produce no waste. How can we have as little waste as possible? The it's a really eye-opening experience to go to the dump 
especially when you're dumping more garbage in there and plastic trellis and netting, and that is not a renewable resource. And that shit, it can't be broken down for a really long time. It does not feel good. Not pretty, you know, there's so much waste that can be produced in commercial farming and just the world in general with lots of plastics and single use things. And how do we not have waste? And um, that's a really deep question actually to ask. And the more every year we get to where we're not producing waste because we're making our own teas now. I have the jute netting and like that just gets composted back into the soil if it needs to be. Um, we use as much glass as possible, you know, just trying to get away from a lot of plastics, but it's kind of hard in this day and age. Um, but another thing too, like I'm really big into trash. Trash is a thing that I've really thought about a lot. And so another way that we're looking at doing our trash is we've created a whole trash center where we um, collect and store different parts. I have one that I'm trying to create a compost pile with like the little pieces of plastic you can't compost. I mean, you can't like recycle like the green tape we used to use, little pieces of the plastic netting that you just find laying around still, even though you've cleaned it all up. Um, any of the uh, hay bales, the hay bale string, the tarps, you know, the tarps just disintegrate. So all that shit I've collected now and I'm trying not to use a lot of that stuff, but I've created a compost pile that I, I put soil and straw and everything else in. I'm going to inoculate with mushrooms. So I'm going to try to figure out how we can have like, you know, re, you know, just be able to knock down that plastic. And then the rest of the trash, some of the trash we um, collect and are putting in big bags and are gonna use as some of our insulation for some of the structures we have going on the property. So, you know, let's just get creative. That's really what some of these principles are about. You know, here's some really good principles to live by and how you perceive each of those is, you know, take that to that level is the, is the fun part. So it's the next one. Let's see. Uh, Design from patterns. From patterns to details. Okay. Design from patterns to details. I don't know about that one, except so it's basically <laughs> sacred geometry. Okay. Okay. So you're, again, you're looking at patterns, grid patterns, uh, natural patterns, reoccurrences, and then use that as your design footing or your foundation. I like That'll that. I like that. That's yeah, definitely, definitely kind of look from nature to see how nature does it and get onto the details. Integrate, integrate rather than segregate. Yeah. Like how do you integrate all the native plants that are around you then segregating it? That's one really fun thing I like we like to do too. And um it's like making sure we have some native plants within this garden that we're cultivating. So you have your native bug species that they have like their banker plants. I love using a lot of like native species integrated into my gardens. So the natural um, predators can live there. And, and then it's just like, how do you integrate the landscape you have, you know, into your garden? For us, we have lots of rocks. We have so many fucking rocks that we've started integrating that into all of the building and, you know, of all the gardens and stuff and utilizing that as a really beautiful resource um, to beautify things as well and hold stability. I think it's just like how to work with what you have instead of like going against, you know, and so that's a lot of this, like how to flow, how to integrate instead of work against and try to clear out like, how do you work with this tree that's in the middle here? You know, do you need to get rid of it or can you use it and grow like some more um, shade loving plants underneath it? So. Um, use small and slow solutions. Oh yeah, use small and slow solutions. That's one I've had to, to work one of the principles of permaculture is start slow, start small and expand. And for me, I kind of start big and I go feet first. And so it's been a really beautiful permaculture thing to integrate into myself is learning how to start smaller and being able to see your system and if it's working and then expand upon that. And then is this working? Oh, maybe not. Let's, let's just shift this a little bit. And then we keep expanding instead of what I've done is have to redo everything and start over again. And so if we can start small, then um, we can expand out and you're actually able to see your environment and how things are working better. The old saying, low and slow, right? Yeah. 
and, and also <laughs> when you when you do it that way, if you do make a mistake, it's not a huge mistake. It's just a little mistake that's very mm -hmm. easily correctable. Great principle. <laughs> Use and value diversity. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good one. I love that. I use diversity in everything. I mean, because go look in the forest. What's going on there? Is there the same plant everywhere? Is there the same three plants? No. You can't even figure out all the different plants. There's sometimes just so many right there. There's so much diversity making up that forest floor and, and the different canopies from it. And that's how nature does it. And I feel like that's the way we should do it because that's how it's done for all time and how she, you know, how she wants it done. So diversity is just so key in being able to maintain a good balance in your ecosystem because there's so many parts of that diversity that you're not even realizing is working between having your birds be there, that bird song helping your plants actually grow to the minute life going on down deep within your soils, the roots connecting, your mycelium, everything's talking. And so that diversity is just so powerful for the health of your soil and like the whole ecosystem. So I think that's within ourselves too. We don't all want to be alike. We want so much diversity, you know, and diversity in life. I think that's the key to everything is a lot of diversity. So that's if the key to health. anything I've learned during the past year and a half, it's that everybody loves different opinions on COVID and on <laughs> Donald Trump and Joe Biden and... <laughs> Everybody embraces alternative perspectives. Yeah, we're all living I, in I'm, these. I'm being sarcastic. You know. But it's true. It is diversity. And it's like, if there we all thought the same, it wouldn't be fun. You know, we wouldn't have anyone to argue with. <laughs> there wouldn't be all these different conflicting things, but then it wouldn't be unique until each experience. And yeah, I think diversity is beautiful. Okay, so the next one is uh, use edges and value the marginal. Oh yeah, the edges, edges are awesome. Um, there's several different ways you can like perceive edges. Like there's the edges of the forest, you know, as a forest ends and then like the meadow or something begins, you know, you can use that edge because that edge is also gonna have a lot of life sitting there. You have a lot of um, bug diversity, you know, and ecological life just because you have your shade going to your sun. And so you're able to, if you're able to incorporate some of those corners into your garden, like I, I have some trees that are right beside my goddess garden and I like having just that right there and I keep it all native, all the native plants underneath where the tree is going into the garden. Um, and I don't take anything down. And But then also I look at my edges around the garden too and I utilize all those edges for different plant species because I edge, I love edging my gardens with um, like the lemon balm, the lavender, the rosemary, some of these drier plants that are also um, like the volatile oils, the smelly plants, like I have to call them white sage, anything that um, doesn't need as much water, but then also has um, a lot of those volatile oils to it because it's like a pest deterrent. So that's one thing I love to edge my gardens with. Um, but then, I mean, there's so much about the edges that you can be able to utilize. And when you really look at the environment you have and being able to utilize the shade versus the direct sun and the different life that's there, so. I like to think of the edges as the gray line in between the yin and the yang. And that's the mm. best place to surf. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay, the very last one, creatively use and respond to change. Yeah, I think that's that's a good thing to see in our, all of our lives <laughs> is to creatively use what you got and to creatively you know, use your resources and um, what did it say exactly? Creatively use and uh, re, re I just lost track of my thought. And, and respond to change. Okay, and so you're responding to that change for like, okay, let's just say as humans, we need to be able to creatively respond to what's going on in this crazy pandemic times. Like if we're not able to respond um, and like, you know, automatically and we're caught up in these belief systems, I feel like that can really hinder us moving forward. But if we're creatively able to use even this right now going, 
oh my God, everything's shut down. How am I going to work? Okay, well, what can I create? What do I need to create? Like for us, we started creating like a ton of antivirals and we created this whole like line of products and switched really fast so that we could still have income and still help, you know? And so that was one of our ways I really love in our business. We're able to creatively like respond to change like immediately because there's so many different um, things that we can create and do with the herbs and things we have. But the same thing in your land, like you need to be able to see, oh my God, there's like a creek running through this area or something's happened. Like how can you creatively use this fallen tree that fell down <laughs> and that's fucking huge and be able to utilize it into the landscape or how can we make this beneficial to us and like having to respond to that change where it's there now. That is one thing that just happened to us this year and we've gone really creative with this giant tree. In fact, we're actually creating a couple of um, thrones with the big wood out of it, but everything else went into Hugel's. We ended up um, just doing lots of different projects with it and it was really fun, including collecting some of the pine needles. And, and so like for us, that's, that was like a huge one is just getting really creative and responding to what's changing, changing environment. Like we have a, a completely different environment shifting out there. It was a lot wetter a few years ago and now every year it's just getting a little drier and we're having, having to respond to that change by remembering how I grew in the desert. And so that is, you know, and the hugels that we created and kind of creatively being able to, you know, utilize what you have and respond to that change. So, yeah. Love those principles. Love I them. too. <laughs> yeah. And Very so well defined. Like, yeah. So adaptable to any circumstance, you know. Mm -hmm. I got the little power of them. So, Peter, were there any other so questions? The, the hard hitting oh. questions. Uh, what are you smoking and uh, <laughs> what, what do you like to grow and why? Okay. What are you looking for in your cultivars? Um, my, I love growing different, um, like different various ratios of CBDs and the different THCs. And so I was just smoking on a one-to-one -one that me and Joey created together, the Citrine OG in the Ringo's Gift. And, um, that was like a Tahoe Diamond OG crossed with African Orange. And then that was crossed with, um, a Ringo's Gift. And so I've created a lot of different strains with the Ringos and now starting with the Love Laughter and some Harley Sue, but I love the different ratios of CBD and THC and also some of the hemp I've just been doing and it's getting really high ratios of CBG. So those are some of my most fun things to play with and what I get really excited about. I've got like two to ones. I've got some high THC with like one or two, you know, CBD in there to ratio it to percent and to all the way to, you know, high CBDs with just a little THC to like that mixture in between. Um, and so those are really fun for me. And I really like finding terpenes, different terpene mixes, you know, like linalool and limonene. I use a lot of for helping it, like there's a lot of people with anxiety like that's a huge thing in our society is anxiety and linalool is a really powerful terpene that can help with that and um so that's been one of my things i try to grow for and i'm always searching really high linalool strains and lavender and those purples and those indicas that really give you that relaxing feeling without like that paranoia and so it's kind of a mission i have and growing a lot of strains is just really getting those medicinal benefits in there there is a uh, you mentioned hemp so there was a question about growing hemp and uh high thc on the same property his question was or his or her question was from a uh regulatory standpoint but also my question would be kind of from a pollen drift standpoint um, from a regulatory standpoint, I can't do that on my property. And that's why I'm going to eventually have, you know, one of my properties be hemp and then the other with the cannabis. Um, and so that is just because of regulatory. But if it wasn't dealing with that, I would try to put them on the same one. And I mean, there is a, um, you will have a drift in pollen if you're not regulating your males. But my thing would be to regulate those mills and to make sure I'm like walking the fields and I'd probably get everything tested because but I'm not also doing like 10 acres of hemp. I'm only doing like small portions of what I can do and what I can produce and what I can use for my products. 
So yeah, it's not really too much of an issue that I found for ourselves as we're doing it. There was a question on uh, kind of chop and drop or just, you know, instead of composting, maybe just leaving the fan leaves and other stuff on in the area on the ground. I do. I definitely do. I, I when I just pruned all my plants, I put that I just put it directly onto the soil. And less when I was pruning, I saw a bunch that had some flowers beginning. I'd make a tea with that. But when I'm pruning, everything goes back into the soil. And then I um, put straw on top of that. And then I'll do like a tea. And that way everything's breaking down with that microbial solution. But I love just dropping my leaves directly onto the soil. I think you answered that. <laughs> yes. I believe in adding lots of diversity constantly. <laughs> as much diversity as possible, as many flowers as possible. And um, yeah. <laughs> I'm laughing at a, an S Bob comment, his bong rips comment. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know, I don't see any other. We, we, we've got a good uh, three hours and 20 minutes. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> How do you feel? It's 420 on the East Coast. <laughs> All right. Don't worry. Um, when, when you get off, the crash will set in. <laughs> yeah, this is a good flow. And then once you're done, you're like, oh, I need a nap. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate you talking for three hours straight. Not a lot of people yeah, can thank do that. You. Thank you very much. Um, you're a beautiful soul, and I'm happy that you were able to come on and, and share your stories with us. I mean, you're an inspiration. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Warrior. It was an, or, it was an honor. <laughs> yes, at the Heal underscore Thyself Gardens. And then we also have a website that is, I believe it's up and running right now. And it's heal slash thyself slash gardens dot com. And all of our products that we're working on right slash now. Slash or will be underscore? Up. Slash. Dash, you know, like a dash. Da oh, dash, Heel, dash. Heel, yeah, a slash, sorry. <laughs> Heel dash thyself dash, dash, dash gardens dot com. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're working on all of our topicals and CBD body products. And some of the tinctures right now are about to go up. And I have smoking blends and, yeah, just whatever, all the different things kind of we're creating and really going with our product line right now. And um, then also, I think me and Joey are going to be in Tulum in February. We haven't figured out the date yet, but we're going to do a natural farming workshop down there. And we're going to collaborate with some friends of ours. Sauce Winery, Flynn and Alice, I believe, are going to join us for hash making camp. And I'm going to do a medicine making day. And then it's going to be, we're hoping to do it around the full moon and do like a cacao mushroom ceremony while we're down there and visit some pyramids. So we're looking to do like an educational kind of vacation for people that want to join us down in Saloon. But that'll be on both of our um, Instagrams and we'll put on our, any kind of like social media. It'll be out soon. Nice. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, is it lunchtime yet? I know you got a full belly, Peter, but I'm friggin' starving. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I had to, as I saw the pastrami sandwich with nothing on it, I was like, I found like the Dijon mustard. I was like, what can I put on this? So, yes, but I, I, I've eaten an entire pastrami sandwich during that conversation. Um, just quickly tonight, we got a. Uh, a little clubhouse time. Uh, it's that the room's going to open at six, uh, but uh, to redeem myself, I have to go pick up some lobster for anniversary dinner. <laughs> oh boy! And, uh, <laughs> so I'll be back to stream two, channel two at seven. Um, but anyway, that's going on in a in a couple hours. So hopefully by then, uh, well actually. <laughs> I will probably still be in the doghouse, but <laughs> just get those lobsters, maybe a couple of oysters too. That'll get you out. Yeah, she, her, and her mom eat lobster and steak uh, like they've never had it before, and they're never allowed to have it again. Every time they have it, which is all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. 
All right. Anyway, anything from you guys? Uh, we will. Uh, we're still working on a few things behind the scenes on that, but yeah, we'll uh, we'll hopefully make an announcement on Friday or something like that. Uh, pastrami is probably not overly healthy, but it is delicious. <laughs> yeah, that has nitrates for sure. Diversity, sure. diversity, diversity. <laughs> right. I salad. Uh, now my breakfast was. No, I didn't eat any breakfast today. Never mind. <laughs> what did I eat? Well, salad What's with up, dinner. What's up, Pedro, our bubble hash enthusiast? So, all right. Well, thanks, everyone. It's, uh, yeah, it's 125 on the West Coast, 425 East Coast. And, and you're in Lake County, right? I think I mistakenly uh, thought you were in Humboldt earlier. No, uh, yeah, Lake County. That's where I'm at. Right now, I'm just up at Humboldt. <laughs> but I, I'm in Lake so, County. So I'm just reading the comments. Yeah, it's going into the compost. <laughs> Good man. Which, which also my <laughs> wife hates because I have a big compost tum I, I have two 55 gallon compost tumblers and worm bins uh, right outside the, the house, which uh, is, is also another uh, dog house. Uh, Bone of contention. That's right. awesome. <laughs> so. Anyway. All right. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you yes. guys so much. Blessings. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> tell, tell Joey thanks for doing the tech support in the background. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Awesome, brothers. It was really great to be on here with y'all. Pauline uh, says so goodbye. You, you got a Tulum yeah. fan. Yes. All right. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Peace out. <laughs>